Okay, we're gonna do a mic test. We're getting all official with our audio here. Thanks, Robert. Okay, so let's just start down with Wade. Is that what you want us to do individually, or test, how do you want? Test, test, test. 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 Test, no. Test, it's splashy. It is. <laughs> there you go. No, it's splashy. <laughs> Talk when it's What does that dead. mean? Test means you may have to borrow jewelry. <laughs> or just not say anything? Would that be better? <laughs> test. Oh, there it's red. Test. Test, test, test. 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 Okay. test. Testing one two three four. Yes. Oops, I'm not on. Test. Yes. Test. Hi, Robert. All right. Welcome. We have a full house. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Julie Taylor. I'm the board president. And I call this meeting to order. Um, just as for your information, we had a principal's report prior to this where we got to hear from three of our fantastic principals about their schools and the great things that are going on in our district, and we appreciate them coming. We heard from Bear River High School, A.J. Gilmore, Harris Intermediate, David Lee, and Mark Taylor from McKinley. So all red schools, like they all, all your colors are red, right? <laughs> all the way up, so it was great. Um, we're going to start with our reverence by Clyde Wolgamuth. And then our flag salute and pledge of allegiance will be by Wade Hyde, be led by Wade Hyde. state and in this county. Thankful for all the economies of life which we enjoy. Now this evening as we attend to the business of this district, we ask for help and guidance as we discuss those things that are necessary. We ask for understanding, for listening, for kindness, and that we be decent in all the things that we say and do thankful for this wonderful school district which we have, for the superintendent, the board, the administrators, the teachers, the students, the parents who are all part of this. Help us all to find the best solutions for our district. Again, we're thankful for the many blessings which we have and the many things we enjoy. And we'll give thee thanks for all and say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Clyde and Wade. And we're going to now turn the time over to David Roberts, our business administrator. We get to swear in our student board member, which we're so excited about. So I think she's in the back. Yep. Yep. Michaela Morris, come on up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay. 
And Michaela, we're going to ask you if you could just introduce yourself a little bit, of, introduce yourself to us, tell us a little bit about you, and so we can get to know you just a little bit better. We're excited to have you. So my name is Michaela Morris, and I'm from Park Valley. I'm currently a senior at Bear River High School, um, and they asked me what I hope to contribute to this board, um, and I hope to contribute a student's perspective, but not just a typical student's perspective, but a high school student, a Bear River High School student, and also a student who was raised in a rural community and attended a rural school. And what I hope to uh, gain from this experience is more knowledge and skills about the education system and in hopes that it'll help me pre prepare for my future and maybe a future career in the education system. Well, we are very happy to have you. Thank you for being here. And we think your mother is wonderful and all she does to contribute to our education system. So we, we, we look forward to good things. Can I, can I just add one thing? You sure can. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, she just last week won the, the, the grand champion, reserve champion for the, the steer at, the, at our fair, Fox Auto County oh. Fair. Big, big deal. So. That's a big deal. All right, we're going to turn our time over to Wade Hyde to do our recognitions. Uh, President uh, Taylor, now that the Nucor grants come first, and I'm not doing those. Oh, so. okay, yeah, let's do those first then. Okay. That you you ready for that? Okay, <laughs> sorry to put you. So we'll do the Nucor grants first, and then we'll move on. Thanks for pointing that out, Wade. You're welcome. Thank you guys very much for, for having us here. I'm Lewis Cruz with Cindy Reed. Uh, I'm the maintenance manager at Nucor in Plymouth, Utah, and it's very privileged for us to be here with you guys this evening to uh, pass out some awards and stuff. So give us a little time. We've got several to go through, but uh, thanks again for the opportunity to be here. We do appreciate it. So hopefully I won't mess this up too bad. Uh, the first one we have is uh, Box Elder High School, Chase Goddard and Bonnie Robinson. Uh, it's for teaching robotics and microscope slides. Uh, the teaching robotics, if I can give them out, if you'd like to hear that, is uh, $1,538 to the teaching robotics. Uh, and 1,000 to microscope slides. I don't know if these look for here. Yeah, come on, come on up. Okay, you're very welcome. Okay, uh, next we have Bear River High School, uh, Jed Christensen, uh, sound system for special ed classroom, $125. Uh, David Schaefer, pipe and tube bending in the well shop, $6,500. Preston Ritchie, there's two here for him. Uh, projector for international competition, $649, and cordless drills, $143. Preston Ritchie, projector and cordless drills. You're very welcome. Okay. 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 Uh, next on our list is Sunrise, Matt Renderconnect, uh, Human Biology, $500. Okay, uh, this is, next one's Box Elder Middle School, Sarah Percy, uh, Drone Engineering Extension, $500. Maria Brana, Reading to Pass the Spanish AP Exam, 240. And Ben Kunzler, Engineering Coding Design, 315. Next is Bear River Middle School, Rhonda Pace, uh, Physical Science and Waves Educational Tools, 400, and Electronic Balances for 8th Grade Science, 650.
Okay, I hope I got this one right. Alice C. Harris Intermediate, Erica Bywater, Radical Rockets, 440. Uh, also, Joe Thomas, I'm not the chicken about learning chemistry. $500. Okay. Next is a uh, century. Uh, we have Lindsay Danes, decodable readers, 500. Misty Curtis, reflex math facts, fluency, 300. Katie Shea Hodges, science in their hands, 350. Piper Roper, Physical Education and Health Education, 200. Don Vincent, Math and Science Manipulatives, 235. Uh, Discovery, Becky Gordon, Maker Space Table, 665. Wendy Rupper, Scholastic News, Science Spin, 325, and Tiffany Wilcox, Building Big Ideas with Little Minds, 400. Yes, this will be it for me. Uh, Tiffany Rhodes, Math STEM Engagement Tools, 375. Angela Christensen, Third Grade STEM Supplies, 600. And Kimber Lear, Math Manipulatives 225. And next, uh, we have Garland, uh, Katie Schaefer, Nicole Nelson, Cody Barnes, and Maylee Hirschfeld. I hope I said that right. Science of Reading Decodable Books for First Grade, 600. Kaylee Throop, Playground Equipment, 150. Amy Jo Summers and Lori Jacobson, Decodable Readers for All Learners, 600. Uh, next is Golden Spike, Shaylin Aikens, New School, New Opportunities, and New STEM, $600. Next on the list is Lakeview, Kimberly Wilson, We Want to Be Genius, $900. Uh, McKinley, uh, April Jardine. Science Spin, Scholastic News, 300. Tiffany Fisher, Gearing Up for Learning, 205. Christian Kendrick, Jamie Therer, Danielle Scothern, and Amy Ayoit, maybe. Learn to Read, Read to Learn, $1,000. Uh, Mountain View, Lynette Savoy, Write and Write Again, $520. North Park, we have Kelly Neeson, Reading for All Learners, Kristen Riley, Engaged Readers and Inside Recess Relief, Playground Fund, $150. Paulo Carrera, Germinating Our Science Curiosity, $1,000. You're welcome. Uh, next on the list is Park Valley, Samantha Gone, ELA Small Group, $160. Uh, Three Mile Creek, Emily Zito, fourth grade math hands on supplies, $250. Next is uh, Willard. We have Natasha Morgan, Mini Materials, $70. And Brady Holder, Take Home Library for Little Learners, $440. And the last one on our list is uh, Independent Life Skills Center, Christina Smith, School to Work Skills Curriculum, $400. that uh, wet. 
Oh, the mic is still quiet. Let me. It, Bonnie Robinson. I think that uh, has everything for us. Yeah. We do appreciate it again. And uh, thank you. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. I just wanted before you leave. <laughs>
so the students get a better experience. She sees the best in the students and cares for them a lot. So congratulations, Serenity. Appreciate it. Also, uh, Jeff Morris would like to recognize, um, along with the Board of Education, uh, Heidi Jo West, who is our assistant superintendent in elementary. Uh, and this is what uh, Mr. Morris said about Heidi Jo. Heidi Jo is a motivational and inspirational leader in our school district. She has worked really hard to streamline things in our elementary schools. I have been really impressed with her organization and the support that she offers to everyone. When I need help, she gets back with me and provides support in a timely and helpful manner. Once, even with a disclaimer, I'm returning your call before calling my husband or daughter that have called repeatedly. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, Heidi Jo, for all of your hard work. Okay, and last but not least is uh, Jackie Whitaker. Jackie Whitaker is in our uh, district. Is Jackie here tonight? Oh, she's ill. Okay. Um, it says, in moving to Lakeview, uh, Mr. Morris said, I have put in a lot of time focusing in on creating a school-wide behavior plan. I could not have done it without Jackie. She has been there to listen, suggest ideas, and to give me resources. I am excited with where we are at our school with our plan, and we wouldn't be there without her. So thank you to Jackie. So that's great. And then Clay Chernis, assistant principal at Bear River High School, uh, turned this in for Robert Gordon. And I know Robert Gordon is over here. He's our IT, I, I, IT um, technology master in the district. And um, Clay Chernis said this about Robert. Robert Gordon is always doing everything he can to make technology available and user friendly. He has gone out of his way to make things happen for schools and is always willing to think outside the box to make things better. He has a great demeanor, even when he has to tell you that something is not going to work. I always feel that he is doing the very best he can to help no matter what. Thanks, Robert. Appreciate you, Robert. Thank you. Shailene, uh, Shailene Eakins, who is principal of Golden Spike Elementary School, uh, emailed this about um, Cody Howard. Uh, Cody is such a rock star. He has been working tirelessly at Golden Spike for many weeks and longer, I am sure, trying to get us up and running from setting up teacher workstations and display boards to printers, time clocks, and student computer cards. He has done it all. He stops in each day to ask if there is anything that is needed and quickly responds to the SOS call. Cody is personable with the staff and knows his stuff where technology is concerned. I am sure that I don't understand or recognize half of what Cody has put into making Golden Spike run, but I am sure grateful for the time and effort that he has put into ensuring that we are a success. Cody understands the importance of technology in a teacher's world and how it can benefit and support student learning, and I am so grateful to know Cody and have him on my support team. Is Cody here tonight? Okay, Cody, would you stand, please? Okay. Thank you. I, I believe I, with all those hours he's put in, he, he is still kind of a newlywed too. So he, oh, is that's he? Pretty, all right. That's pretty darn good that he's put in all those hours. <laughs> I, you, I need to add from the, from the back row here, there's no way we could have opened Golden Spike with the technology needs if it wasn't for Cody. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. Our next one is uh, from Ashley Nelson, who is principal of Willard Elementary School. And this is for um, Brady Holder. Brady is an instructional coach at both Willard and Lakeview. Not only does she have to attend meetings and events at both schools, she also has to keep track of teachers, parents, and students at both schools. 
I watch her selflessly run back and forth and take care of everyone and everything. She works double time with a smile and a positive attitude. We love and appreciate Brady so much and are so lucky to have her on our team. Hey, is Brady here? Would you stand please, Brady? Congratulations. Great job. Thank you so much. And Gary Allen, our assistant superintendent uh, over uh, secondary, uh, presented, uh, presented this to the board. And uh, this is given to uh, Sergeant Jared Glover. Uh, Sergeant Glover recently presented information about active shooter response to all of our district employees. He gave his presentation to our staff members in Brigham City and Tremont. Both sessions were well attended and he was available for questions and answers. He has worked closely with the school district with the active shooter training and he has been supportive with other training and issues. He works closely with our student resource officers at our secondary schools and he is a great liaison with the Brigham City Police Department. So is Jared here tonight, Sergeant Glover? Okay, well, we appreciate him so much. So. And then this last one is um, uh, for Principal Jeff Morris. I know Jeff is here. Uh, this was given by Heidi Jo West, who's our Assistant Superintendent. Says, Mr. Morris has used his skills and talents to support the Spanish-speaking families in his school boundaries. He has taken the time to visit many of the homes of the families and introduce himself. He translates letters and communication as well. Mr. Morris makes personal phone calls and is making every effort he can to engage these members of his school community. We are grateful for the work he is doing to ensure that all the families in his school feel included and well-informed. So thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And we do appreciate all of you. And, you know, I know many of you have to leave. So before you leave, if we recognize you, please come up. We'd like to, as a board, like to shake your hand before you go. Okay? Thank you again. And you start right over here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Super job. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you, Kayla. Appreciate that. Oh, Robert. Oh, Robert. oh we Robert. gotta shake Robert. Robert's hand. Okay. Congratulations, Robert. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> well, you know, um, Heidi Jo didn't come. Oh. But maybe she's too busy. Heidi Jo, I guess we'll just wave to you. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations, Heidi Jo. <laughs> Thank you all for being here and supporting and, and celebrating. This has been a great, great recognition. Thanks, for, Wade, for taking are, care of that. You are welcome. So you're welcome to stay or you can, like Wade said, <laughs> enjoy the rest of our meeting or you can head out. Okay, we are now at the point where we need an approval of an agenda. So moved. Okay, we have a motion by Karen Cronin to approve the agenda. A second by Nancy Kennedy. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So our first thing is public comment. Mr. Meekin is one. Okay. So we have one public comment. And just as a point of reference, we try to keep them to three, three and a half minutes to keep them moving along. And if we can give answers now, we will. But if not, we will inform you at a later time. So Thomas Jensen, is that right? Okay, is here. And so if you'll just speak in the microphone, that would be helpful so we can all hear. Oh, wow. Thanks. <laughs> um, thank you for letting me talk. Um, I'm a local. I'm from Kern, Utah. My wife and I bought a vending machine business that specializes in providing healthy snacks. 
And what's unique about these healthy snacks is they are USDA approved for schools. And what we would like to do is provide Box Elder High School with these vending machines with your guys' approval. And so I have a list actually. And the vending machines are fully programmable to ensure that they are healthy and appropriate. So anyway, that is the short story of my intention for being here. You just mentioned Box Elder, not Bear River, not Sunrise. Well, I'd be happy to put vending machines in those places. <laughs> I'll be honest. And so, I, didn't want um, you, I didn't want you showing favoritism to right. the bees. <laughs> I might have a little bit of favoritism. My kids will be going to Box Elder High School, but they're pretty small right now. So. But I'd be happy to put vending machines in those schools as well. So. Are there any questions? I believe you sent an email to me this, this week. Yes. So I, I sent it to Dave Roberts, our business administrator, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it and figure out. I did send that to you, Dave. So we'll, we'll talk about it and see what we need to do. Okay, yeah. that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here and for the snacks. <laughs> These meetings get long sometimes. So. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Okay, that's all we have for public comment. Um, so our next, we're moving on to our action items. We have, um, we need to approve the Sunrise High School Comprehensive School Improvement Plan. Gary, do you have anything you need to tell us about that? Uh, approve their CSI plan. Um, if just a couple things as a refresher. Uh, they have not met their requirements that the state has for 68% graduation rate. We've had a steady increase for the last four years. We're close, but not quite there. So the state rules say that they have to go on to the final year of the of this CSI. Uh, we hope it's the final year. That includes some uh, what the state says that they would uh, they can come in and take over the building. They can provide additional training and leadership. Uh, so the requirement was that we had to get a committee together. Uh, the committee met. Uh, that included uh, parents, uh, Jeremy Young, our uh, assessment, uh, special education was represented. I attended parents and then some of his staff. So they have recommended, uh, you'll see before you that their recommendations I'll save you from reading all of those. Just a real summary, though. They have the pods, and they've assigned their mentors. They call them their mama bears, and they have contact with about 10 to 15 students that they follow up on. Recommendation two is the positive behavior plan. You saw those in the uh, earlier meeting today. They are working on theirs as well. Uh, they do believe that positive behavior will lead to better attendance and graduation. And then the last one is uh, we've changed some of the things on the referrals from the high schools, and that would be moving them into the adult ed or the GED track. So those would be the three recommendations. And I would recommend that you approve those. Uh, after your approval, these are submitted to the state. They have another committee that reviews these recommendations. They will either accept them or they may modify or give us some additional uh, requirements. Okay, are there any questions from the board? I just have a question. Um, you said that we didn't meet the 68. Where are we at? How close are we? We're at 63. And we think we'll, we think uh, we're going to make it, but we're, we're close, but not quite there. Any other questions? Okay, do we have a motion? I'll move. We approve the uh, Sunrise Comprehensive uh, School Improvement Plan. So we have a motion by Nancy Kennedy and a second by Tiffany Summers to approve the Sunrise Comprehensive School Improvement Plan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that will be approved. Thank you. I really, I, I remember the growth that's happened. So 
I guess Principal Jackman's left, but <laughs> that I, I think good things are happening there. So I'm, I'm anxious to see how this plays out. Okay, um, we're moving on to our information items. We are first going to start with the transportation report from Jason Sparks, who's our transportation director. Thank you. I don't know if who's ever running this can pick up and key hop one of these. So let's do the report to the state first. Thank you. I don't know if you need to enlarge that. Yeah. A better or right. There Perfect. So and then go up. There you go. Thank you. So one of the reports we have to do is annually report um, the number of miles, eligible miles uh, that uh, our buses are doing. And so this is a report, a highlight of some of those uh, that I have the report to the state. So activity trips versus field trips. And let me just explain the difference. A field trip would be kind of the, the, the students are passing. They're just going to that, like the zoo or going to a movie or something. An activity trip would be defined that they're actually involved in where they're headed to. So either a sporting event or, or whatever event, competition or drama or anything would be identified as an activity. So comparing the, the difference 2021 to 2022, we had zero miles for activity trips for elementary. And then 77 and 22. So elementary don't do a lot of activities that they're actually involved in. Uh, secondary in 21, we had 59,136. And then in 2022, a jump to 83,843 miles. So that's miles of getting the, this pick when they, we pick up the students, get them to the place, pick them up, and get them back to the school. So that's those miles. On field trips, uh, 2021, we had 659 miles. 2022, a significant jump, uh, 13,534 miles. That is miles. That's actual miles. And then uh, secondary was uh, 1,342 field trips to uh, 4,451. So as COVID has eased, we, we, we picked that, those miles back up. And then the next one is eligible miles. So these are miles that were our buses are picking up based on moving kids from their stops where they're picked up to the school and then back to their stops. So these are our eligible students, eligible miles. In 2022 or, or 2021, we were 1.2, so almost 1.2 million, and 2022, 1.3 million. So we did have a jump there. And then some other things we have to report is minutes, minutes that we're doing, uh, working with uh, within the transportation. So to and from school, we're up 15%, nearly 16% in the number of minutes that, that students are being transported to and from school. And then on activity and field trips, as we talked about in the miles, that's nearly a 60% increase in the number of minutes. And then in driver instruction, the year previous to this last year, we're up 105% of the minutes that was involved in training our drivers. So we've spent an enormous amount of time. And, and if we expect drivers to be safe, we want to train. And we also want to train them on what we're wanting them to do and how to handle situations. Um, instruction and supervision is up 26%. And then other staff, that would be our paras. And we're up 180% with the training with them. Uh, from 21 to 22. And then just activity trips per uh, uh, school, that just breaks it out. Boxville High School, 37,000 miles. Bear River High School, 40,430 miles. Box Elder Middle School, 528. Bear River Middle School, 1,836. And then we've got the two intermediate schools pretty close, one at 1,678 and one at 1,719. And those would be activity trips. Again, an activity trip is a trip that they're actually involved in versus passive. Uh, cost of the schools for field trips. And so this is something we get asked a lot. You know, wow, it's expensive. We actually haven't changed what we charge per mile for a very long time. Um, and costs have gone up tr tremendously. Uh, so we charge right now $1.80 per mile um, for a trip. 
And uh, just in fuel alone, that was 68 cents per mile. And that actually has gone up. That's what, and uh, just in fuel alone, Dave, what did we figure we were just last year, the last two months, 200,000 increase? Yes. Yep. Just in fuel. Uh, with the cost of fuel going up, we had to absorb that. And so that's something to be aware of. And then as far as just maintenance, so that's just Per bus, the cost of maintenance would be 900. That doesn't include other things like tires and um, lubricants and all that. That's just my mechanics working on buses. So there is a cost, and, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that's offset with the state, but there is some cost. Uh, we do charge $20 per hour for a driver, but currently, and that's a typo, I got that in wrong. Uh, it actually is almost $21, our starting driver. But typically, our drivers that are driving trips are going to be much more than that. And then I think on the agenda tonight is to talk about the, the bill uh, or the, the meals. And currently, we do $10 flat. And the problem I've seen is having drivers go find a dinner for $10 and a lunch for $10. And so that's why I was looking to come online with what we're doing with other employees and have that be $9 for breakfast, 12 for, for lunch, and then eight, 16 for a dinner. So, and that's kind of just some key, key um, points. Yes. A question back to the, the, the minutes. Yes. So when you say to and from school, is that because we have more students that we're transporting, or is it taking longer we, for students we, to we, get there? We do have more students we've picked up. Um, we're up significantly in the number of students, uh, eligible students. Um, as, as well as um, distances okay. and, 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 you know, what, what we're what doing. We're doing. Okay, I just yeah. wasn't sure if that so was... So there, there's a combined both thing those. there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, any other questions? Yes. So, um, I see signs around saying we need drivers. Yes, we do. How many are we short? And we're a beautiful situation so that I'm not driving and all of my staff in the office aren't driving would be about 15 additional. Uh, since I uh, took this position last July, so I've been in over a year now, we've hired nearly 28 drivers, but that's, we just kind of stayed even with, with, with what we lost and the need for more drivers. I created some additional routes because of some overcrowding situations and pulled some of our subs. We virtually are at we, I'm the sub, and we're the subs, and so that's what we're trying to build. I've got more people signed up for in two weeks, and we'll move them on, and I just hired two new drivers this week, and so we just keep, we had the bus and the parade, we're looking for ways and doing everything we can to encourage people to come and drive and be a para, too. It's not only drivers, it's paras we're meeting as well. And what's the age re requirement for that? They have to be 21 to be a driver. To be a para, it's 18. Um, so when the cost of fuel goes up, does the state adjust how much they give us based on it, price of fuel? Yes, it's a lag and it's an interesting situation. And so one of the things I visited with the um, uh, state director for transportation, and we're one of the districts that got caught in a situation with the amount of miles we do and what we were going to receive. And they were going back and looking at 2019, and the problem is, is we've had big increase and so he's working with at the state level and he's pretty sure that we won't be held hostage with that that difference and lose that amount of money we actually have senator scott sandal that he's aware of that and he's trying to help us with the it's a legislative analyst that's looked into this so uh, yep. and it's been it's been us uh san juan millard tooele some of the great big districts that have to travel so much they've kind of kind of gone and re-looked at their their numbers and yep. it's really put us in a little bit of a bind and and so I think we're getting some help from the higher up. It was interesting when I went to the uh, a director's meeting in the state level and I went there thinking here we are Box Elder we're a rural somewhat I'd be with all the small districts well they did it by the number of buses and so I met, was meeting with these districts that were in common other than I have a lot of buses and then I went to Indiana to a conference for, for transportation directors, and I was telling them the sure size of our county and the amount of miles we do, and they were just baffled. 
at back east, they're like, I don't even comprehend that, you know. And I was sharing with them how, you know, we have kids on a bus for an over an hour and a half, and they just can't understand that, the distance that we travel. And we have kids that we bus into Idaho. I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, we have six students that we bus from Yost area to Malta to school because it's just not safe to bring them over the hill. And th th that's just a difference. We're such a different and unique situation. And, and, and we do transport kids large distances, as you know, right? Um, Jason, yeah. year, years ago we were told that we drive the equivalent of Brigham to Salt Lake to San Francisco to New York every morning. I'll and have then, to do an analysis. And then I mean, repeat that. One that's, point, so, you know, you take a quick analysis, 1.3 million miles just on the eligible miles and divide that by the buses we run in a day. I'll, I'll look at that. I'm sure it's above that even. Oh, cool. It's amazing. Uh, one of the things that I've been working on as far as for out west is we haven't had a radio that works for them. There's distances where there, there's no radio because, and there's no cell coverage, right? And so it's a concern for me. And so I contacted the county because we did, we do have a tower up on top of Dumb Peak. Is anybody familiar where Dumb Peak is? I've been up there several times now. I even got stranded up there. Oh. <laughs> and we're working, and I'm working with the county to, to get this tower up so we can actually have radio communication with them. And we're really close. I was talking to my radio guy today, and we're going to probably head up Monday again to do some more work and try to get this finalized. And it, from my office to the, where the tower is, it's three hours, just one way to get up there. So it, it's, it's some work. But those are some things we're doing. And um, Jason, if I could just, I, I just, yeah. I, you've said the word or the number two or three times, but basically 1.4 million if you look. 1.4 million, and, yeah. And that's just, just eligible miles yes. getting to and from yeah. school. That's not all the trips exactly. and everything else. But the point to make is that there's a ton of research, and it's, it's out there by the galore how safe those yellow school buses are and how much more safe they are right. than cars. Mm -hmm. And so it's, yep. it's pretty amazing with a bus driver with all the stuff that's going on behind them that's still able yep. to be that safe. So it's really so uh, remarkable. So fatalities in a year. Um, what do you think the, the most dangerous way to get to school is? Not walk. Driven by your teenage brother. Driven by a teenage driver. 60% <laughs> of fatalities are are being driven by a teenage uh, sibling or teenager, okay? Um, the next dangerous is a parent is in a car with another adult driving, and that's about 38%. Fatalities on a bus is 0.02. So the safest way, even if maybe they're hanging out the windows, <laughs> I know they shouldn't be, but is on a bus. The bus is, 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 is a, and, and uh, actually when I went to that conference in Indiana, we got to, to they had us, they had a, a, a bus run into another bus at 25 miles an hour, and we got to witness that. And it was, even at 25, it was quite horrific, the noises and everything. And we, and I, I don't have the video, but sometime I'll share that with you that I have. But um, even that, you know, the buses are designed. They're like tanks, and they're built around to protect kids. And so there's a lot of safety in that. Any other questions with that, that data there? Let's jump to eligibility, because I know that's been a question, and there's some angst with that. And um, so I'll, I'll, we'll jump to there. The state, you, you asked about, you know, how do they cover that. So the state will cover 85% of the cost of transporting eligible students. And so that's a chunk. It's not everything, but they'll cover 85%. But part of that is they are very strict in how they determine what an eligible student is. And they define that for a secondary student to be a student that has to live two miles from their school. And an elementary student to live 1.5 miles. And they don't say close to that. They say specifically that is the, 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 the guidance. Yeah. Right. Right. So if we go down to the, um, Keith, if you can roll that right there. Oh, we'll keep go back down. Right there, R277-600-4. The distance from the home to the school is determined as follows. 
from the center of the public route open to public use opposite the regular entrance where the pupil is living over the nearest public route open regularly for use by the public to the center of the public route open to the public use opposite to the nearest public entrance to the school grounds which the student is attending. So what does that mean? We have a routing program that tells us, okay? Now, one of the questions that comes up is, you know what, we have SNAP plans and we have safe walking routes. The state recognizes that and actually, actually says, yes, those routes are going to be longer than what this measures, but you're still held to what this measures regardless. So they don't really give us a lot of latitude. They're saying, this is what an eligible student is, this is how you measure it, and this is exact. Okay? With that said, they do give us a little bit of wiggle room, and it's not much. And um, what that is, is there, uh, a school district shall not be penalized in the computation, and this is R277-600-11, and again, this is state statute. A uh, school district shall not be penalized in the computation of its state allocation for the presence on an approval to and from school route of an ineligible student who does not create an appreciable increase in the cost of the route. So, what is an appreciable increase? And it goes on to define. There is an appreciable increase in the cost under subsection 2 if because of the presence of an ineligible student of the following occurs. A, another route is required. B, a larger or additional bus is required. C, a route's mileage is increased. D, the number of pickup points below the mileage limit for eligible students exceeds one. And significant additional time is required to complete a route. So it's pretty defined. So, we look in Brigham City, we've got some students and, and Tremont who might be 1.9, 1.8, 1.7. And as I look at those neighborhoods, there are a lot of ineligible students. So if I was to net all of those students, it would create another bus, or it would create more stops, or it would create more mileage, um, or it would potentially supplant eligible students. And so that's what we have to weigh into. So there really isn't a lot of, of latitude with, with having ineligible students ride an eligible route. Okay, so this is really, I have, I'm on yeah. the line, yeah. <laughs> like literally. You, you're on the line, and guess what I am too, because so, my and, neighborhood's on the line. And so I've, I've been hearing this from, yes. from neighbors, and, um, and we've always carpooled and it hadn't been a problem, but what, how do you determine, because it seems like, now this is just, this goes back, I, I'm gonna get, my, my experience from another district when my right. kids were younger, we were on the line as well, and every year at about two to three weeks in, they would say, okay, now if there's, if there's room on the bus, you can apply, and we could get a courtesy stop. But basically, right. we just took them to where the regular stop was, because right. we were like right. the point nine or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, my question is, how do you determine if it will increase the number of students? Because like, for example, I have kids in my carpool that are eligible, right. but they're not riding the bus. Right. So how do you, that's my so question. So that's where we'd have to go next. So once we're sure, you know, when we get to October 1 count, is typically when we know, we feel like we're, we know where those routes are. Mm -hmm. Then I can look at those routes and say, okay, where do I have some, some potential opening? And then we would go look at, okay, do we look at who's the farthest? Yeah. Do we look at who may be, and, and, and that's a good question that, you know, and maybe that's something we can go into a I think closed session, a policy, or a something policy that, that we talk to, about, because yeah. we really don't have anything set there other than we could look at that and then we could start to, 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 to pull those students right. in. Okay, that's why I was just wondering, how yeah. do you figure out, yeah, do you, we, do you we have, have a map an, of all the kids? And right, and I do have a map, and okay. I can look at all of the ineligible and eligible students, uh -huh. and then we could look at and we could, you know, create some rings based on, and that routing program would tell us. Okay, well, that's good to know. I wasn't yeah. sure how you figured that out. Yeah. Okay. And so we could look at that and then go from there. Because I think that's something that, because um, I know in the past, mm -hmm. everybody's just walked to that bus stop and rode the bus. Right. They didn't have and, to be And part of eligible. what's happened is with, with the app and with what yeah. we're doing, we're tracking it and we're ensuring that it's eligible students versus yeah. 
not always that case. Yeah, and I agree. I think it's the right way to go. I doing fully it district wide. I fully support it. I just yeah. think we need to have a policy in place yep. if there is room, because yep. my neighbor rides the bus and I don't. My right. parents work and his don't, yep. and now he's eligible. But I'm not. You know, there's right. there's situations that so we need to have time talked, to call policy. And we both talked about looking at some other districts, looking at some policies, and then we could come to you with that. Okay, so. I appreciate that. Thank yep. you. And then one other thing, if you, I'm sorry, I'm picking up a lot of time, but um, another question comes up, stops. Why is the stops where they are? The state also outlines that a stop have to be a third of a mile apart, unless that third of a mile puts it on a bend or puts it somewhere that's going to be dangerous, okay? And so we'll go look at that, and we can put an extra stop but they really are looking for efficiency. They don't want us to have any multiple stops that are, that are they're closer than a third of a mile. They look at our efficiency of our buses, dead miles, and so we really have to make sure we're fulfilling that, that role. One of the questions that comes up is parents get concerned about where the stop is from their home. And so R277-600-6 states, a parent or guardian is responsible for a student's own transportation to a bus stop up to one and a half miles from the home. And so it basically the state states it's ultimately up to the parents um, to get that child to that stop. If they feel that distance is inappropriate or there's anything that's not appropriate within that distance, it is their responsibility to get them to that stop because we are limited on how many stops we can have. So. Any questions? It can only be a th a, within a third of a mile, so we can't put them closer than a third. I think Jason's referred to R two seventy seven a few times, but if you look in this policy, you also you also see Utah code. So just a quick little demonstration or explanation of what we do and what our board has to do is the legislature, of course, creates the the, the laws or the code, and then from that, our state board of education. They put together a list of their rules and regulations, and they're the R-277 rules. Therefore, uh, uh, public education is the R-277. And then, of course, the Board of Education, our Board of Education, takes and looks at those rules and kind of thins them down or adds to them because they can and makes the, the Box Elder School District Board of Education policy manual. And so it's all of these, as you look through that, I can see Utah code... 728109 and you see these R277 rules so it's really complicated but it does filter down from the top down to the right. school district and there are multiple reports we have to generate to the state that are based on this and so any other questions thank you thank you Mr. Jason thank you madam president <laughs> may i yes sir may i ask if we could get these folks right here to introduce themselves and tell us I it's so awesome to see high school I'm assuming high school students you might even be you could be freshmen in college but high school students would you mind introducing yourselves and telling us who you are and why and maybe maybe this gentleman I I'm not sure I don't mean to offend you but you look young too so <laughs> okay good no I'm not referring to you mayor <laughs> not even close <laughs> Yeah, Go ahead and introduce me. I'm Corbin Chase. I'm Mike And is this for Mr. Gerlach? Yeah. Very good. Thanks for coming. And she's awesome to see you guys here. Thanks for pointing out. I was wondering the same thing. I was like, I thought you might be here for the recognitions, then you're still here. I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Some of you are even taking notes. That's impressive. <laughs> okay, and thank you, Jason, for that that explanation. I think that that will help all of us as these concerns come up. But I, I've been in this situation years prior, and now I it's it's kind of angsty for some. <laughs> but that I mean, it, it is the rules, and that's we're we're trying to do our best to get our kids safely to school. So, 
Okay, let's see. We're going to our construction update. Corey, there you are. Got some skinny popcorn here. <laughs> I'm not sliding, so I never know how to get in the room. Not all. Those just. Okay. Are you okay if I can say B? Yep, I know. I just point or okay. whatever. Okay. So, time to give a construction update. Um, the bulk of this is with Grouse Creek and the renovation that we're doing. Um, I, I think it should be in your board books. There are some videos. Hopefully that's big enough for you. If not, I won't be offended if you look at the bigger screen. Beep. So those of you that, who have been to Grouse Creek and looked closely at the building, um, and I've been told it's Grouse Creek, not Creek, and I'm getting a nod from the one who would know, so thank you. <laughs> if you look closely at the exterior of the building, this is the side opposite where the church is. So toward the play area. If you look closely, there's a mixture of building types on the surface. There is um, evidence of the mortar gone, the grouts out of the lines. Um, quick. So this is one of the front corners. And then click the other front corner. And at the right side, <clears throat> the right side is where the kitchen is, was, and that corner has been settling for years. We've been watching this crack get wider and wider, and we fill it in, and it gets wider and wider. And so there is some real evidence, and if you remember this structural analysis that we, we received from a structural engineer, it was pretty alarming. Um, so click. The first thing we had to do was abate the asbestos. It really tore it down to the guts of the building. And it was really evident after that what the structure was really like behind the sheetrock. And, and it was interesting, the, the things that you find that weren't meant to be a time capsule but were, behind the sheetrock was chalkboard that had just been covered up. Click. And this was behind one of those. So I figure we better at least take a picture and have evidence of some great artwork from somebody out there at one point that did that just before it got covered up. Um, click. This is one of the interior doors. It was going from the old portion into the vestibule that led into the gym. You can see on the left-hand corner above the window really, I mean, just a crack. This is a structural wall. And before we go to the next slide that I have that shows some of the footage of the demo, I brought some show and tell. Um, and it really is evident as to what the material was like. Now, I don't want to disparage the craftsmanship or the hard work that they did back in 1912, because I truly do believe that they did the best with what they had. Um, but being 110 years old, it's seen enough years that it just wasn't safe. And we, I think we saw that in the, the structural analysis. So I'll pass these out. Um, do you want me to still try to be on a microphone when I'm doing this? Or should I just talk really loud? I'll use my face. Okay, so the first one, the biggest one, it's interesting. You would think that by the size of it that it would be heavier than it is. Now, it's a big rock, and it is heavy, but to me, I'm thinking, well, that should be heavier. So, I mean, I can pass it down, but some of these, I mean, you want to, but some of these are a little bit easier to, to handle. Thank you. 
It's definitely not granite. I'm not quite sure what it is, and we have several types here. As I pass them around, you'll see, you'll feel that there's different density to it, and there's just different fill. It, it, it's a sedimentary, but I don't know if it's sand or lime or, or what. And you can notice in some of them, there are layers that you can actually break off. So it is sedimentary. And this is what the building structure was made of. Do you want me to just kind of pass them down? Do you want to kind of... Okay, you're good. Okay. This now, in, com in comparison, this is a brick. I have a couple of these from when we tore down Thunderson Elementary. And it's, it's just incredible how much lighter they are. Um, the stone that we use. So, come on, it, it's like elementary school. We gotta, have, we gotta have some show and tell here. So we'll pass this around. This is some of the mortar from the building. And you can feel how soft it is. Notice on the brick from Bunderson, the mortar is still stuck to the brick. You'd have to actually get a cold chisel and hammer to get that off. These rocks that we've got here are from the structure. The mortar just fell off, and you'll see that in the video. It just, there was no adherence. And yeah, we, we've been really lucky. I better do this over here. So just a piece of the mortar, and it just, it just crumbles. It just goes. Nothing. Just goes to dust. I'll pass this one around. Um, two different, two different types of rock from the same structure. Take out your keys. Take out a pen. Something. You can just scratch it. It just powders right off. We're on the building. <laughs> if it didn't stay very long, maybe a year, and then it was all erased, and you could do it again. So, um, is it okay if I just dim the lights while we watch some of these videos? Okay. Hand, so I feel this my old you can so, do it. So notice on here, he just bumps that with and it just crumbles. <laughs> As opposed to Box Elder and Bear River, where you couldn't knock those walls down with the track hole. So that's yeah. that's yeah, scary. Really, really scary. I mean, this is a corner. Okay, let's go to the next really one. Watch that one again. This is probably the better one because it really shows the, the block up close as to what it really does when it's bumped. It just Man. falls. Just you can go to the next. So, if you remember in the structural analysis, we need the mic. If you remember in the structural analysis, it had some pictures of the roof structure. So it's, it wasn't just the rock, but up in the roof structure, there was really no vertical, mem there were no vertical membranes holding the roof up, except for those two by fours that were about 20 foot long that we stubbed in there when we had some sag in the roof. It's unreinforced rock. Really. It wasn't even mentioned. Are you getting a prayer to live back there? And yeah, the pat that. They were coming. Did you see the evidence of that? No, I didn't get close enough. <laughs> I didn't stand far away. It's not a fall through the ceiling. We 
we did have some some people around that were videoing and taking pictures, and there were a couple of kids there videoing it, and but they didn't go to school. But that you can see really well into the roof structure. He's being really slow and careful because he didn't want it to fall the opposite way into the tomb. So that's why it's being so slow. This is DWA construction. Yeah, they're just they just bumped them in the tomb so much. Did we ever see this? Yeah. yeah. No. Okay, so go back, go back one. Yeah. So this picture with the track hose sitting in the middle of the pile, that was about 45 to 50 minutes after he started. That's as long as it took to get that far. It, it came down quick and it came down easy. Um, so yeah, we are really lucky as a school district that we didn't have an earthquake out there or a strong wind. Um, so. It's not funny, but I, I guess that's how we deal with stress sometimes. And and you know what? I think more importantly, we're we're very fortunate that we have students that didn't get hurt. Right. We would we right. would have been very very foolish to extend that beyond what we did. We already extended it enough. It needed to come down. Yeah, yeah, it really did. Okay, so now current pictures. Um, this. Last week, this was the view out the front doors to where the school was, from the gym out. Quick. So standing back at the playground, looking at the school, that's the gym. And where all the rubble is, that's where the new school will be located. And I just have several of those. We can click through and see. OK. Timeline. So this is at the Support Services Center, the North Bus Shop. They are building it. We're constructing the buildings there, and then we're going to haul them out. So that's how we're going to save a lot of money is by because labor, there's nowhere to stay out there in Grass Creek. So the, build, the platform or the decking that they're working on right now, we're going to haul these out in four pieces two essentially single classroom spaces and two that are each double classroom spaces. So that, yeah, the picture we just saw was Monday afternoon. This was Tuesday morning. So they're really working quickly. The uh, trailer load in the back, you can see those are the walls. They're constructing the walls in a factory in Ogden and going to place them on the decking, their goal, their hope is to get these moved out before winter because once winter hits, the state will not issue permits to transport buildings over, over the roads. So we've got to get these out there. Yeah, all of these above, it's whatever they decide. But, but we're, our, goal is, our goal is November. The, the contractor's goal is November. So next week, they are going to start working on the pad. They should have all the debris cleared away this week and next week start working on the pad. And here's the good news. You always want some good news with this. Um, kudos to DWA, our contractor. They did some investigation. They found a, a I guess it's under BLM, but it's a, a pit that we can get pit run from for all of the um, gravel rock that we need. We need approximately 300 tons of that material. And because we are a school district, um, nonprofit, we are able to, and I'm, I'm waiting for them to sign the contract and bring it back. I've signed our end, send it off to them. They're, it's kind of just a technicality but we'll be able to just 
use that without a cost. We have to reclaim the land, but 300 tons of pit run that is about two miles from Grouse Creek School. So it's gonna save us cost and it's gonna save us some time. So there's a bit of the, of the good news. Okay, click. So on this, any questions on Grouse Creek before I moved over to some of the other projects that we have? Please. Can you, sorry, can you tell us, uh, remind me what's being done to the exterior of the gym to make it okay. blend with the land? Yeah, so our plan is, because the gym is a combination of, and I don't have a picture of it, sorry. Well, I don't know if it was, I don't know if it's clear enough. But anyway, it's a combination of a typical, yeah, okay, right there. You can see that it's a combination of, of a cinder block and a regular brick. And so we're gonna, we're, our plan is to paint that the same color as the hardy board siding so that it, it all blends in and, and matches. Yeah. And that should get rid of that one patch spot on the one side of the gym that kind of looks like an eyesore. I wish I could give you a good answer on that. Um, initially, our hope was by Christmas. But talking with Mrs. Morris and the teacher, they're geared up to be in the gym for the year. Our, our hope is that we can, what, how, does, how does Robert always say it? Under promise and over deliver? So that, that's the hope is that we can be pleasantly surprised and get them in there sooner than that. One, one of the crucial pieces on this when we were beginning all of this discussion and design is either we can move in before Christmas break, you know, during Christmas break, or we wait until after the end of level testing. They didn't want to have that kind of disruptive nature to the, to the structure of the school there. So Corey, will they do all the interior finishes here? Or do we have to send someone out for they, them to They do will some? do as much as they can. They, okay. they say they can do all the tile work, flooring, all the finishes they can do and then move those buildings out there. Okay. The exterior and the roofing they'll probably have to do out there because, so if you look at that, the front entrance is actually in the middle of the two sets of, of buildings. So there'll be a 10 or a 12 foot hallway between the two buildings that's right where that entrance is. And then they're going to take trusses out and overbuild to connect those two buildings so we have one pitch instead of you see two pitches and it looks like we dropped a bunch of portables out there. We wanna make it look like a real building. We're just building them as modulars to save money, but the finish work will tie it in as one building. Um, the rock that you can see there, it's a Harris stone rock, and that will have to be installed out there. It was interesting, we, we were meeting with, with the, the contractor to pick the Harris stone, and, and the one installer said, no, where is this? Because he was in our office, and we said Grouse Creek. Where's that? <laughs> How far is that? Oh, it's about two and a half, three out. What? <laughs> so anyway, eye opener. But anyway, so what else on Grouse Creek? Please. That new building. To me, I, I'm just so ecstatically grateful to have a new building like that and to have our students in a in a better, safer environment. But I don't know, maybe that's not how people feel. I don't know. So I'm not gonna put words in their mouths. I'm I'm gonna ask Melissa, maybe you wanna come take the mic. I'm gonna guess that the feeling is excitedly frustrated or frustratedly <laughs> excited. <laughs> She's, she has a, she ha really does have a good understanding of the community. There, you know, it's really, 
or they don't. <laughs> Um, so I think that they were a little bit frustrated just because of the timeline. They thought it would have moved faster than what it did. So I had to explain, you know, there was some budget, there was some of these problems, and so I think it was okay. Um, and any frustration, I've kind of sent either Corey's way or superintendent's way and just said, hey, this is what's going on. But I think seeing the building and going down and just the safety, that kind of opened their eyes a little bit. Um, and we still have some on both sides of the fence, but I don't know if that helps you. <laughs> that comment alone is worth her drive from Park Valley. <laughs> okay, anything else on Josh Click? Okay, Click. Okay, we still have projects in the works. We always have projects in the works, but some some noticeable projects that we still have that we're working on. Um, we have McKinley Gym Floor. We have Box Elder High School hallways. We have secure entrances. We have Bear River Middle School North curbing. And we have support services, center additional storage. And then we have various fencing. And so I have some pictures on those first five bulletins, or first five bullets. So McKinley, if you've walked in McKinley School previous to a few weeks ago, you saw old lighting, ceiling tile that were mismatched, falling down, stained. You saw floor tile that was mismatched and old. It needed, it needed a facelift really bad. So that's what we did this week. Um, this was part of our, our long-term capital funding that you approved last spring. But now, as you walk in that main hallway, so that's okay. It's okay. We'll unwrap the present. And, no. Yeah, yeah. So as we walk in the hallway, that the flooring is a rubber flooring, and it's the same from that point all the way through the cafeteria and the gym. So it's all one. The, and I apologize. I could kick myself. I didn't take the four pictures. I don't know why. I just I didn't think to. I'm sorry. But the ceiling tile is new lay-in ceiling. It looks great. It has new LED lighting. Click. Um, my worry about this new gymnasium flooring is that now everybody's going to want it. But the ceiling, we painted the ceiling so that it's all fresh. We have new LED lighting on the ceiling. It's just bright. It is night and day in there as to what it was. We... So this whole flooring is a Mondo rubber flooring. Um, the, the court lines are painted. So the reason that this is a, a project still in progress is I took these pictures on Monday. The paint went down on Saturday. That paint has a cure time of at least seven days before kids can, before you can get on it and walk across it. And so He's not still here, but Mr. Taylor and um, the head custodian, Phil, have been fantastic to work with. I, I feel bad for the staff and the students because they've been really displaced for the first couple of weeks of school, not being able to get in here. But the payoff, I think, is really going to be there. Click. So this is looking from the stage toward the classroom area. We have, so we have the normal basketball court lines, and then we have the white, bigger circle that you see there. That's one that the PE teacher requested. It's great for when she lines up her students in a circle, and that's kind of their parachute circle. If you've ever played with a parachute in PE, you know that that's like the highlight of your elementary school years is we get to use the parachute, and you go in it. And so that really helped them. And then you can see the shiny lines. Those are called phantom lines. That's the same color as the flooring, but it has a gloss finish to it. Those are for pickleball. So. And then this is the logo that they have on banners in the school. Um, just it's crisp. It's sharp. It's just it's new. It's fantastic. So. They have another week, and then they can be on it. Yes. 
and until this week, I'm not sure what they're doing this week. I haven't asked Mark with the rain. Yeah, yeah, they were outside doing picnics. It was good weather. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's heading to the, the north side of the school. Well, they so they can get from the office to the classrooms now. That was blocked off while they were doing the flooring, but now that the paint's done, they've got that so they can get in there. A lot of inconvenience, but the payoff. So this rubber flooring doesn't ever need to be waxed. Um, it's just it's just wash and go. So it, it's a lot easier for the custodian, and it's just an all-around good floor. No. It's a natural latex rubber, and so for the first six months, the custodian is going to absolutely hate it. Hate it. Because it's sticky, it's tacky, it's hard to clean. But after about six months, those natural paraffins work their way to the surface, and it gets this dull, slick shine that is just fantastic. So some inconvenience, and then decades, decades of benefit after that. I would hope we don't have any elementary students wearing stilettos in there. Um, <laughs> I didn't ask about stilettos. <laughs> I hope not. OK, I'm glad we have some Box Elder High School students here. So these are your entrances to the hallways. Is it ever congested? <laughs> ever since the building was constructed, we have two doors into those main hallways, and it is a complete traffic jam every, every single class change. And so what we're doing, we have, this didn't happen as quickly as we'd hoped because of lead times, but that whole doorway and windows, we are in the process of replacing. They're being built right now. So instead of two doors, we'll have four doors in each hallway so we can just move people through um, quicker. It was a little complicated because those are fire doors. They're held open by electromagnets that are tied to the, to the fire system. The fire alarm goes off. Those electromagnetic, electromagnets release, the doors close. So we had to have all of that, all of those components in there too. Um, and then you notice that this hall Right at the bottom of the picture, it's shiny. That's an LVT. In the hallway, it's carpet. Two of the halls are still like this. The other two, click, are all LVT now. And so that's the next step after we replace the doors and the whole storefront is to get LVT in the other hall also. Yeah. That's what's at Box Elder High. At the intermediate schools, we are in the, pro well, it's, it's pretty much done now. There are some wrap-up things that we're doing. We put a third storefront for security. It essentially makes a secure vestibule and creates a service counter. So this is Harris Intermediate. And if you look, that yeah, so the outside storefront and then the inner one to make that vestibule and then we have a third one in. And we, we had to be creative on that third vestibule. So click. You can see it doesn't go all the way up to the ceiling. It goes enough that nobody's going to get in there. But because of lighting, ventilation, um, we had the fire alarm systems and HVAC all in that area that this was just a better solution instead of trying to take it clear up to that triangle peak in there. Click. And then this is, it's an L shape. And so it forces people into that window right there to your left. Um, click. And so you can see through the door on the right, you can see that window there. And that's where people would come to and say, I need to check my daughter out of school. She has an orthodontist appointment or something like that. Or 
the secretary has a, a button that, that then that person can be buzzed in. We can unlock that door remotely and the person can come in if they have some other business. We are also in the process. We still have some schools that we need to put secure vestibules in. Um, we have various approaches to that. We still have North Park, Century, uh, Willard, Discovery, yeah. Yes, yeah, so Young and Harris are this exact same footprint. Yes, that window was always there, but it, it, was not an, it wasn't a window that would open. And now we've replaced it so that it opens so they can actually talk to people in it. Yeah, and, and each school, Harrison and Young, both took a little bit different approach as to how their office staff is using that and moving, but it's, it's the same physical design. Yeah. So at North Park, we have a large vestibule, and if we put additional storefronts, then we really cut the flow of students and the pathway. So the idea would be to make that current vestibule just secure, lock down, and the secretary would have a button that she could buzz that and, and let people in. At Willard, that one's a little tougher because we have such a small vestibule to have people stuck in there waiting is, is kind of tough. And so the idea would be to put a third vestibule just past the office door. At Century, if we put additional vestibule or additional storefronts, now we're cutting kindergarten off from the rest of the school. We don't really want to do that. So we're kind of brainstorming. We're thinking that we're going to have to make just a secure vestibule of what's already there. That, that's something that we're trying to address right now. If it's creating a secure vestibule in what's already there, um, the hardware for the doors and the buzz-in system, we can typically do that for under $10,000. It's just a matter of getting the material here and getting that done. And then discovery. Discovery is kind of a quandary the way that that's designed because the entrance to the gym is before we put a vestibule forcing people into the office. I don't know if we do an L shape again. That one's kind of one that we're still in the works on. No, we're just, we're just creating a secure vestibule. And, and we're trying to go off the model of Three Mile Creek, Garland and Fielding uh, you walk into those buildings and it forces you into the office. That's what we did at Lakeview. At Lakeview, we actually cut a door in and used the same vestibule, but it forces you into the office. At McKinley, we moved the storefront back into the school more and forced people into the office. So they don't have a freeway just straight into the school. The reason I ask, I've had a couple of parents call me from those other schools about concern about safety, yep. and I just said I think we're doing it um, a little every year. So I was just yep. hoping that maybe by next year we could have them all done. Yeah, that that's the hope. My, I would I would greatly hope that we'd have it done before then. Yeah. The active shooter training for all employees, and then uh, we have a committee that we're working with with the police department. And our goal is to have a Box Hill or High has one every year for a parent and student night. They also do an assembly during the day at the high school. So we're trying to do all of those as well with the individual schools. Uh, so it's kind of a team effort on both buildings and then the, the parent nights. I appreciate that information. I, I went to that active shooter presentation. That was so such good, useful, practical. Who knew you could stop somebody with a three-hole punch and throwing papers in a three-hole punch? I mean, it was just things you could do with what you had and distraction, and it it was marvelous. I really, I thought it was very, very well done. 
I was just going to say, there, there's a lot of um, people out there are kind of nervous, so I, I appreciate the information and as much of that as we can get out that we're really working hard to make sure that our students are safe. Okay. This is Bear River Middle School. If you remember a year and a half ago, and we, we cannot find anyone or any documentation as to any agreement as to what was going to happen between the school district and, Bear, and Garland City and that road that's north of Bear River Middle School with curb and gutter. Um, so Garland City had a, they hired an engineer and he developed the curb and gutter and sidewalk drawings for that whole length of, of street along that property. And I sent it on to our contractor and it was about 150, at least 100 to $150,000 more than what we had budgeted for that. And so we met with our contractor and um, the engineer that designed it and Garland City Mayor, Mayor Bourne out there. And we just, we talked through it. And I said, you know, he, here's my real concern is we're gonna spend Three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollars to put that infrastructure in, and in seven years, we're hoping that we can do something to that property because that building needs to be upgraded on our next bond. So we're going to do all that work, and in a few years, we're going to go back and we're going to tear it up to create new approaches and everything. And I just asked them, so what? What's the real concern? Because it's not. It's not stormwater, it's not runoff, because right now for decades, that's just been going into our grass. And Mayor Bourne said, you know, the real concern here is student safety. And we all agree on that. And the student safety would come in that crosswalk that you can see on the right-hand side that goes across. There's a, I didn't get it in the picture, but there's a, a substation across the street and then neighborhoods behind that. And that's really her concern because of the traffic that's on that road when kids are coming and going. And so I said, well, what if we do this? What, because we have a sidewalk on the west side of that gate that's pictured there. What if we continue that sidewalk over to that crosswalk so that they have a safer path right there for congregating until they went across? And I said, if you just at least think about that and let's – you know, see if that can be a compromise, knowing that on the next bond cycle that we need to do something to that property anyway, and then we'll know what we're going to do for the next 50 years um, on that. And, and so they, they were amenable to that, and they were talking about it. I haven't heard back from her or the engineer yet, um, but that's where that stands. Okay, click. So we have a need. We always have a need. You never have enough storage space, right? So we have a need for additional storage in our district. And especially within the next five years, we need some short-term storage for curriculum that's going to be coming in all of a sudden and then gradually dispersed out to schools. We have a portion of the Support Services Center that was left unfinished because it's it wasn't quite sure what would happen with that. It's in the food services area. It's never been finished because there's never really been a solid idea or plan that came to fruition. So what we're going to do, and we've already started this, we're going to add the floor drains in there in various places that would be strategic, apropos. I don't know what the right word is, but strategic is probably the best one. And then pour a floor in there that's strong enough for a forklift and put racking in there for storing pallets. Um, in the future, if that area needs to be reclaimed for food prep in some way, then we find another place for storage, pull the racking out, the floor drains are already there, the water lines are overhead. Um, so we've already started that, click. So this is the interior, and just the other day, this week, click, 
We already have the lighting. You're gonna see how much brighter it is. We have some high bay lights in there. Um, the plumber is getting in there tomorrow to do the floor drains and then we'll pour it and we'll bring the racking in. So hopefully that will help with some of our storage needs, at least temporarily for the, the short term. Um, the other thing that's gonna be ongoing for this entire year is Golden Spike Elementary. <laughs> They're in, they're holding school, it's a great place. There's gonna be stuff that we're working on all year to get all of the systems balanced. Um, one classroom is cold, the other one isn't as cold. It, just trying to get all those balances working, but it's, it's been good to this point. So, any questions? Does anybody wanna take home a letter? No, thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, sand. If, if you want one that you can carve in and it's gone next year. So I have a question because I know we've got city uh, mayors, former mayors and people here. I'm curious why Garland's expecting us to put the entire bill for the curb and gutter. Is that standard? So how does that, that work? It would seem they're going to benefit no, more than we are from having that up. Maybe Street. I'm going to let them talk, and then I'll tell you what I've been told. Well, and I'm just curious how <laughs> cities do that. The central district and then the people that live there sort of pay for that, pay for the improvements. Yeah, typically, and, and we had to do this when we built the tennis courts at Box Elder High. If you improve property, you need to continue the improvements of the utilities, the curb and gutter and sidewalk. Uh, <laughs> One taxing entity talks to another taxing entity. So. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or can I just interrupt you for a minute? Please. Our new student board member has an appointment that she had before, long before this, so she needs to go. So if we'd excuse her. Yep. Thank you so much. You're good. Thank you. I know the road is very steep on the other side of that crosswalk. Is that a corner? Is yeah. there a reason why the city can't strike that crosswalk down where that sidewalk begins at the end of that property? So we don't need to go back to it. So go back. that um, the crosswalk Go straight across to the north. There's a substation there, but there is sidewalk around that. So it does go straight from our property to a sidewalk. Not seeing it. My first thing is let us restrike that crosswalk down where the students are probably be yeah, right. straight on straight onto the yeah. to the sidewalk. So yeah. you know. But I don't know the whole situation, but that's my first when I saw that photo, I'm like, why don't they just restrike that crosswalk? Can I add a little bit to that? I know I on the main street with the high school, we've tried to move crosswalks. We're looking at the state new crosswalk. Is asking a lot. Mm -hmm. They fight shifted the now on the highway. So, yes. Um, so the road that that AJ has to deal with is a state road. This one is, I believe, a city road. So, yeah. 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 North of the middle school would be a city road. Yeah. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions? Oh. So are there any other questions from the board about the control? We've got a lot going on. Thank you. <laughs> I, I like the videos. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna turn time over to Keith for some student enrollment numbers. Use your mic, please, Robert's flagging. Jeez, I have the voice, okay. Anyway, <laughs> I'll keep this fairly brief. Uh, Superintendent Kelsey wanted me just to give you a little snapshot of some things. I know that's hard to, maybe I need to increase. That's better, three, and then put the light up there, anyway. Just wanted to let you know uh, one of the things I get to do, October 1 count is uh, basically how many people are, have been in class. They haven't had a 10-day drop. 
uh, they are in the school on October 1. Um, in February 1st, that's when I make projections. I make projections on a formula that I use to say, what is it going to look like come August when we have kids graduate, kids move up a grade, and it's hard to project growth because you just don't know what it's going to be, but we do the best we can. It's one of my jobs to do is to project growth. We staff with these numbers. Uh, we determine, you know, how many more portables do we need with this number, custodial hours, para support. All of those things are based on a projection that I hope is fairly consistent. We go into uh, negotiations knowing this is kind of what I'm projecting and how many pieces I think we may need to buy or it may be need to reduce. So this is sort of one of my uh, important assignments. Anyway, and then what I did is I just pulled off today at you know five o'clock, what does the spire say today with kids in seats? Now, just so you know, we're, uh, what are we, uh, nine, 12, we're 12 days in to school. People right now, all of our administrators are working on those 10 day drops, kids that were maybe gone you know, for the first eight days and then they were, somehow they were there one hour, but then they were gone, gone, gone. So sometimes it's a, a teacher may have made a mistake, didn't mark the roll. Anyway, we're cleaning all that up so that anybody that had missed 10 consecutive days are removed from class. People that we thought would be on the rolls but have moved, people that are moving in, all of this is part of this. So that kind of shows you September 14th. Uh, anyway, um, I'm not much into colors, but I, I have some up here. And uh, I will just say over here on the left, is that kind of a lightish reddish something? Yeah. Uh, these are the closed schools, and you'll see the Century Lakeview um, and uh, McKinley and North Park. Closed out of boundaries. Nobody can go into those schools because they're, you know, you got to live in those boundaries to go to those schools. Um, anyway, um, I don't know what exactly the best place to do this. I will just tell you that last year approximately – and again, we have a couple of out-of-state students that are not part of this number. I'm just giving you a flavor. Anyway, 12,294 students were uh, in our school October 1 a year ago, okay? And what I have to do is use a formula, and I can't give credit for mine. I have to give it to Terry. Terry used it, and I always thought, how this work? He goes, I don't know. It's always worked, and it worked, and it worked, and it worked. But I'll tell you, I'm pretty close when I use Terry's formula and, you know, use some different things. Um, so anyway, I make projections, but the number you see on the right are kind of plus or minus. In other words, I take what it is today versus what it was on October 1st. Again, don't be too enamored by that number because we still have two more weeks of drop, add, whatever. We'll have another October one here in a bit, but you can kind of see. So Bearber High, you know, they have increased by 63 students. I need staff. So they've hired new teachers. They've been very creative with how they position people. But we knew this bubble was coming. I know I know it starts in eighth grade. Eight, nine, 10, 11, huge. Seven, six, five, four, two, not huge. They're more like what we have been. So I'm waiting for this growth because it's not district wide. It is spotty. But we have this big bubble coming through the middle schools and the high schools right now. And you're going to see those numbers. So anyway. Box Elder High, they went from 15, 16 a year ago. And with this big senior class we've got here, you know, we're up to 15.99 as of today, 83 increase. They ended up with uh, two portables, I believe. Is that right, Corey? Anyway, another interesting number, Box Elder Middle School. We heard that they got a lot more uh, people from other uh, charter schools or other schools around, maybe more than they have in the past. I, use, I have a number that I kind of project as a little higher than, than normal. A um, couple things uh, also just keep going. North Park, 65. You know, I projected 547, which was 30. They actually went up 30 more than that. We've added two new teachers and uh, some support staff. That's just one of those little pockets, you know, and, and, and Connie's been telling us about this little pocket. We know. It's just a complicated school. It's closed. It's capacity, and people are still going. And 
That's becoming a little bit more of a 911 of what we're going to do with North Park. We did, we did add to that problem with the CLS. Yep. Yeah, we're bringing kids that would normally go to some other school. So that's also part of the and equation. And also because the funds were saved, they had more money for a full day kindergarten. For a full day kindergarten. We added there. Which that 65 is really some of that number. Yep. It's not as much in my grade. Which but those by those variables certainly have caused that to be a little. It's still a problem. So, so Keith, can I, so yeah, the. The DLI, like at North Park, is that all settled now? There's no more kids coming in. That's that's settled. We just haven't filled the program. What, what grade oh, okay, you okay. Well, and every year we're going to add another class. Uh, you need so two more. No, we're in first and second grade, so next year we'll oh. do first, second, third. We've got to so add three classrooms grade. there that we don't currently have. I so see. Okay. Be portable if we add, because we have to add another teacher. Right. Every year. Right. And the free okay. is still pushing for all day kindergarten available to all students within the school right. district. So. But the students we have in DLI now, okay. that's we're not letting any more in at no, not unless North Park. Some kind of transfer from another district that they were in the same. State oh, I see. Okay. Or, you know, anyways, uh, that's okay. a whole other topic. But uh, next year there'll be a third grade. Right. Right. And, and, and so forth. And, and so it forth. Keeps so so okay. it go up. Even now, not all the even kids more. are in sure. boundary. Some are coming from someone else. So sure. A full fledged program, you can look at Lakeview, is six hundred kids. You get about six hundred, and that's but we're gonna get over six hundred. And it's okay to go more than six hundred, but you gotta get to six hundred to run a really successful DLI program. And we're not quite, you know, we they haven't loved that. We haven't got sixty either year. That causes staffing issues, and we have to have another teacher here, though. So anyway, I digress. Okay. Okay. Uh, you'll see that Three Mile Creek also had some growth that was significant, and you know we ended up hiring two new teachers there. I know you're like, well, every 25 gets a kid or gets a teacher. Well, that is if it's at the same class. It doesn't always divide by 25, so you have to say, how do you keep your numbers down? So those are some of the things I should have noted. I just wanted to point out discovery. My alma mater, just kidding, but my home school, and there's, there were houses being built all over that place, and by dang, I projected that we would be at 521. We're going to have some more modest growth, and by dang, we are down. Now, I will tell you, I think we're down because elementary is, or kindergarten is down across the district, except North, North Park. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, the, our lowest number out of the K-12 is K. It's the lowest we've had in all the years we've had it. For I don't know what the reason is yet. They may come back next year, but they didn't come this year like they have in other years. Or, well, I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> Probably good. Probably oh. bad. So anyway, you can see some pluses and minuses. I can share this with you if you want to do it. It's kind of unofficial. I don't, I don't, I'm, well, I am going to just share it because it's kind of funny. On February 1st, I made the prediction would be roughly 12,400 kids. That was my prediction in February. I had no idea who's building, how many kids they have. Are they going to be in by August? And we're at 12390. We're nine across the district. Now I've screwed up in some areas. <laughs> Thank goodness for average. <laughs> About what I am. Anyway, any questions with that? I'll talk more next month. It'll be a lot of fun. I think that's really helpful. I'm interested to see these numbers because we've been talking about this, the growth and these houses and then where and the little pockets and where they, where they come from and you know there's with a big district i don't think you can like look at predict willard. any better I than you did i drive by willard and there's there's houses and they're down 29 students why because kindergarten didn't come yeah. why maybe it's because the price of houses have doubled and working parents and families and it's just not a family i don't know yeah. but i was but baffled by where we are right yeah. now well, that's interesting. And Good information. Excited about other places. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Keith? Quick comment. Um, really appreciate the school district's willingness to work with the cities 
as we try to communicate with each other and help each other to understand, um, sometimes you may not know what's really coming in the very near future. And so I appreciate the school district being willing to come and sit at the table and talk and so that we can have open communication with one another so that there's not as many surprises. And like uh, Rod Cook used to say, houses do not mean students. And that is such a true statement. And, but at least we can know that these houses or this growth is coming and that we can see the dirt moving. It isn't something that we, we know someday might come. When the dirt starts moving, you have to, I think it's only healthy that we communicate with our school district and we have this open communication so that we don't have as many um, dissatisfied citizens, maybe we could say. And we have them all over. You know, I think North Haven is got a subdivision going, and they're moving dirt, putting in, you know, um, curb and gutter. And so, what is that going to look like? That will all go to discovery. Um, and maybe I was just a, a year behind. You know, you know. Anyway, we'll figure it out though. Okay. Do you want to? Uh, yes, Madam President, I I would move that we um, skip part of our agenda and jump to. H1, building planning discussion with Corey and um, Dave Roberts, uh, discuss Foothill and Mountain View. Okay, is that okay with everybody else? We move that to because Corey's here. So let's do that. We'll jump down to H1 and then we'll come back to our other. Oh, finance. Okay. Okay, so before I do that, there's one update that I, I missed giving, and I, and, and I guess it's because now the weather's good. But air conditioning, I'm sorry, you're seniors. <laughs> I know, bummer. Um, but update on air conditioning, we have already started the behind the scenes work on the mechanical side at some of the schools, Box Elder High being one of those. The engineering is complete on some of the sites and chillers have been ordered. Um, the latest update for chillers at the two intermediate schools, and there's one other one that just slipped my mind. Ship date is set for March. The lead time is really killing us. But if we can get all of the behind the scenes, behind the walls work done in time for those to get here, get dropped on the pad, get hooked up, then the hope, the goal would be that at least some of these buildings we're working on would have air conditioning next fall. So. Um, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't even dare hope that. If they ship in March, then I would realistically hope that they ship in April. We'll, we'll just kind of see how that goes. All it takes is another freeze in Texas and we're done. So. Um, so Mountain View and Foothill, what to do? What to do with those buildings? Um, one thing for sure, if we don't do something, they're just going to become a mess. Um, we do have Brigham City interested in renting, leasing Mountain View Elementary for a short amount of time. They've been working with Dave Roberts on that. so. They could speak more to that, but the reason for that is that they need somewhere to host Meals on Wheels and their lunchtime dine-in for senior citizens while they upgrade their own kitchen at their own senior center. So that's in the works for Mountain View. After they are um, finished using the building as facilities director, I, I would see that that building would not be of use to us as a district anymore. It would probably, in my opinion, be one that we would liquidate. That would be my recommendation. As far as Foothill, that would be one that I would really recommend that we hold on to for at least some amount of time until we get a better reading on what's happening with the economy and with the housing market and with people moving in. That piece of property is really a good piece. It's eight 
almost eight and a half acres. It has street or road frontage on three sides, so it's easier to separate buses and cars. It's only a block off of Main Street, so it'll have really good access into or from, from main roads. As, as far as the building itself, you know, that's something, this is all a discussion for the board, so I'm just gonna say my little bit and then whatever. But um, as far as the building, if we were gonna keep the building, I'd wanna go in there with a structural engineer and find out what we would need to do to bring it um, more modern as far as reinforce the masonry and then do some facelifts. And it'd be hard to guess what that cost would be. I know that's a question that some people would ask. Well, what is that gonna cost? Um, that, that would depend on what the structural engineer finds. It, it could be, it, it, I wouldn't be surprised at $5 million or a little more to structurally reinforce. Um, it, it, it can be quite entailed to reinforce that masonry. Um, and then that amount again, probably for a facelift on the building to bring it up to more modern. I mean, some of those rooms only have a couple of outlets. And so really to get it more feasible as an educational center. But when you take that cost into comparison with a brand new building, it's all that stuff that, that I would say we have to weigh. So I don't know what else you want me to say because I'll probably just end up well, putting my foot in my mouth. Part of the reason we, we put this on, you know, the discussion item is to start to, to start the discussion so the board can, you know, start thinking about what they want to do. And I, I think that we'll talk about that maybe the future uh, on this agenda, future board agenda items, talk about that. The other portion was to discuss the other school. And we have a group of folks here that want to talk to us about that and some ideas that they have. And, and Corey's, you know, we've been in conversations with some of these folks. And uh, I, I would propose that we, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure who your spokesman is. Is that, are you Mark? Yes. Mark Thompson, correct? So if, if, if it's okay with the board, uh, they have a proposal that they'd like to present to the board for what an idea for Mountain View. Is that correct? Superintendent, before, yes. you, before you jump to that, could, could I just add? Um, you want to use your mic? Well, yeah, uh, yeah, yes, it is. Um, for, for future board meetings uh, to start, I don't think it's too early to start looking at numbers and piece projections for that school. So I'd, if we could start putting some of that together so we could get that information on what our projection is and what to do with it. Yeah. Can can I can I add that your father used to sit on this board of education yes, he did. years he ago? He loved it. What a great opportunity, huh? He he certainly did, Clyde. <laughs> and some of us did get thrown out of Box Elder High School a few years ago. Uh, <laughs> quite. A, oh, I'm I'm looking at me. Uh, <laughs> no, that was a great experience, and so I do appreciate your efforts. Man, what a lot you have to go through, and. And I appreciate your service uh, to the community. But we, we are here today, to, uh, as you just discussed, what are you going to do with Mountain View? Well, let me help you to help me. How's that? Um, so what we, we have quite a group, a uh, consortium of folks that are, Box Elder County is really amazing. We have uh, these service organizations that work really well together. Other places, it's a dog-eat-dog. -dog. Who's going to get it? What? We work together as a community because we understand each of us has an important part. And so that's what's really coming together here. And it really is amazing how this is coalescing. So I hope you can see the vision as, as we walk through it. We, we have a great support here. We have uh, Malone Mulgard from our Boys and Girls Club that's with us. I, I am the president of the board of the Boys and Girls Club this year. Uh, we have Tyler Vincent who is on, on the board. And he is also former mayor of Brigham City and helped formulate a lot of the plans that we're working on. And we have DJ Bach, who is the current mayor of Brigham City, who is working with us and formulating the, these plans with us. And so, so we appreciate their efforts.
We have Courtney Gregory, who is from the uh, chamber, and also he works with Habitat for Humanity, as if you needed more to do, right? Um, we also have uh, Megan Telemontes, and, and she is working with the New Hope Crisis Center. What a fabulous effort that they do there. And are you overloaded with work right now? Yes. Uh, how disappointing is that, really? But we need to do what we can to help, help out in that area. We have Susie Witt working here. She's the executive director of Habitat for Humanity. Uh, and, and there were many more. We didn't want to inundate you with more than that in introduction. We will run out of time. But uh, if, if you see, we put a hand out here. It's basically a Box Elder Community Services Campus. And really, we have two anchor groups that are working it. It's the Boys and Girls Club of Northern Utah and the New Hope Crisis Center that will really be the, the large tenants in, in this area. But we have 12 additional nonprofit groups that are working together that would be able to use this facility. And, and the area we're talking about, of course, is the Mountain View uh, building. And it would take a whole lot more than uh, two hours to tear that down. Uh, <laughs> in fact, it, it, it really is a, a fairly decent facility. And, and we see a, a lot of opportunity there. Um, but as you look through here, we, we see that there's a great chance for economic development uh, as this uh, chamber has ideas on, on how they can work through that. And the city also has plans for how they could work with some of those areas. In fact, the kitchen, uh, the, the, uh, he was, uh, DJ has been working with, with the school board a little bit about working that kitchen. What we would propose is the school, Boys and Girls Club would be the chief uh, director of it that would pick up the ownership of the area, and then we would work with these other organizations a as we go forward. Um, social impact, we are supported and partnered with state and local agencies. We have a lot of support from uh, our organizations, from the our state senator, Sandal, who's already working with many of you on other things. Uh, our Blake Moore is working with us in the house to, to work some funding for this. He's very supportive. He's been over there to Mountain View itself, um, really working hard to do that. But if you can see, there's the economic, social, and community capacity of opening the doors for other community e efforts that are going on there. Uh, but really, the two main tenants, if you look on page three, the domestic violence shelter, the New Hope Crisis Center, they need a lot more room than they currently have. Uh, how many vouchers do you have to hand out every year? Over 700 is what I heard. Yeah, and they just keep growing. So they need a new facility, and they are working grants to be able to build that facility, and we have it laid out in our area here. So hope it's a well-thought-out combination that we're working with there. The boy, Of course, the Boys and Girls Club, we, we would be the front entrance and, and kind of be the, the, the mainstay there. We, we'd have the classrooms. And now, let's see, Heidi, you've worked at Mountain View and you've seen the Boys and Girls Club in action there. And you see what things they do. And I think it significantly helps the school district. Is, is that fair to say? And we're hoping to maintain that and, and strengthen it even more. So hopefully it's a, a joint effort with school district, working with the Boys and Girls Club and the after hours efforts. Um, the, there's a family center that, that would be hold uh, the community events with the gym and the multi-purpose room. We'd look to keep that going and have it there for, for folks. There's resource centers, multi-purpose room and community parking. So many things. Uh, next page is kind of the layout of how, how the facility would work. I think that's page four. We don't have them numbered there. So we'd leave a lot of the current facility as it is. Uh, and then community event center would kind of be behind there. And then the family center and the domestic violence shelter would be in the back where they could be protected and have uh, restricted as access to that area. So. Um, 
turn the next page. These are all the things that are currently planned for this building as if we're able to work through this. Just a oh, oh, myriad of things that will benefit our community. And then the next page kind of highlights the project support that we have for it. Uh, the Box Elder Chamber of Commerce got together with the Northern Utah Chamber Coalition, and they highlighted this as their number one uh, social service priority, which is where we're getting some of the funding from both the state and from the federal level, is because we were ranked, everyone saw the need there, and so we're hoping to, to pull in a lot of benefit from that. You can see the elected officials that we're working with, so great support there. W many large suppliers, uh, Walmart is phenomenal support. Nucor is saying they will do uh, at cost all their efforts for that. So we got a lot of benefit as we work this building as we go forward. The Box Elder Chamber of Commerce, uh, Bragg and the Workforce Services, they all see a great need or an opportunity to use these areas for training. And, and then just whatever community events or things that need to happen there, we could pull in together there. Uh, then we have some several letters from Congressman Blakemore as he's working with us on, on this effort. Uh, and those are some of the things. We already have a lot of the funding in place. We have $2 million from the state of Utah uh, appropriation that they're ready to go with us on that. And Senator Sandel really helped out on that. We already have uh, about $170,000 in donations from local uh, residents, and we see that that'll probably grow a fair amount oh, as more people learn about what we're working here. We have a million dollars in that federal appropriation that looks like it's coming here. And then the domestic violence shelter that looks like there'll be about a $4 million benefit coming in a grant form from that is our target right now. And then, uh, the city and county, there's a hope for about a million dollars coming uh, through those areas. So it, the, the funding looks like it's coming in extremely well. We'll be able to fit it in there, uh, and we'll be able to do something that will last for a long time. I, I would hope 50 to 100 years, this will still be blessing the people of our county. So we would love for your consideration in working through this and, and seeing how we can work together to pick up uh, that Mountain View school. Nancy, you have a question. Well, just I, so uh, Monica and Janelle Jeffries met with me a while ago and said I was the first board member they had talked to, but all of you were on the list. I am so behind this project. They're, it, the way to, to combine resources, they've got money to buy the building. They are not asking us to donate the building which we can then go to our taxpayers and say, we're making good on our part of keeping things economically moving, but we can be a part of doing some incredible things. Uh, Tyler and, and my husband and I have been working with some of the, with the, we work particularly with jail, Tyler worked with the youth in recovery. We don't have a place in Box Elder County when we release somebody from our jail for them to go anywhere or do anything. Ken gives them a bus token and puts them on the bus and sends them to Ogden. Um, and I talked with the gals about possibly bringing something like this in. Um, there's just so much good that we can do for our community. It's in an area that people are already there with the, the New Hope is just up the street. People know where it is. Um, I am 100% behind this. I think this will be one of the greatest things we can do for our community. Nancy, that's awesome. Thank you. Oh, I, I, are there any other folks that want to uh, say anything or enhance what I said or what I said about Mayor? Julie, Julie laughs because she thinks I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to get up because Steve was telling me that I was uh, attractive, the attractive guy back here, and you never gave me a chance to come up. But <laughs> um, we, I, uh, speaking from the mayor, the city's point of view, we're behind this 100% as well. Um, Mark had mentioned the lease that we've just entered into an agreement with to use the kitchen. Um, that is just because we're doing a, a much needed uh, and essential remodel of the community center kitchen. There's a new walk-in fridge. 
you had to go down into it, which was posing some problems with the seniors. There was a lot of trip hazards, not so much hazards. There was a lot of tripping that was going on getting into the fridge, and so there's a, a complete remodel there. And Corey mentioned the chillers for, for the high schools getting here about March. That's when we've been told the refrigeration units will end up for us, and so that's why we're from October to March so we can get as much stuff done in anticipation of them arriving. With that being said, I want to uh, make sure that, uh, that it's understood that, that if the board decides to move forward, which I hope they do with this community service center, that Brigham City is not going to say if we need to tear up that lease agreement prior to March, we already are okay with them then honoring that agreement and letting us use that facility. So please don't let us and our need of that facility till March hamper or sidetrack or derail or stop the, the thought process of this until we get out of the building. Don't, don't even do that. We've already got that taken care of between the two organizations. Um, other than that, the only thing I would add is I think that that stone from Park Valley is, is petrified sand. That's why it was so light. Seriously. So that's all I had. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's the Mills on Wills, and, and we, we love that program. Uh, I just wanted to say that two things. Um, for those of you who may not be uh, familiar with the Boys and Girls Club, they help hundreds of families, hundreds of families um, every month, every year. I mean, they the kids are um, getting a benefit out of the Boys and Girls Club, and the Boys and Girls Club need a, a space that they can call their own. So that's a big part of it. Uh, New Hope Crisis Center is huge. Not only do they help um, domestic violent victims, but they also do classes um, that really help and benefit uh, people in our community that, that getting education is huge. And, and uh, right now, Box Elder County does not have that. I'm an attorney. Um, I, ha I do a lot of criminal defense work, a lot of public defender work. When we have clients, and Nancy uh, spoke about this, when they're released from jail, we don't have services. We don't have anything to help get them re rehabilitated or get them moving forward in a good way. Um, one of those things is I, I uh, participate in the mental health program. We don't have men very many mental health um, services here. Part of the plan here is NAMI to be in this building. NAMI would be a huge help in Box Elder County in getting people services that they need. Boys and Girls Club, uh, New Hope Crisis Center, Habitat for Humanity is a huge, um, uh, they're growing, they're, they're uh, building more houses every year to help uh, families. And so that's something that they can, they can use uh, to benefit as well. Chamber of Commerce, um, the reason the chamber is so behind us is we have a real problem with um, workforce right now. Boys and Cl Girls Club is a huge part of that. If, they can, if parents can have a place where their kids can go, it is safe, they feel better about getting out and working. And, and right now with the economy the way it is, it, it, most people have to have two parents working at all times. The Boys and Girls Club gives a safe place for those kids to go. So this is, a, if, if the Boys and Girls Club and New Hope Crisis Center can get this community campus going, it's going to be a huge impact on, on Brigham City and Box Elder County. Thank you. Any other questions? We'll get the really smart people answer, or the good looking ones. Uh, yes. Yeah. Have you had or do you plan to get meet with the community and especially the local area the, the, the neighbors there have you met already with them and getting their input on on your plans I have not Junelle probably has because she talks to everybody <laughs> but um, we, we will we will continue to do that this area is really a great place for us because that's where a lot of the need really is is down in that area so it really fits perfectly in that area uh, state funding gets a lot better be if we're able to put it in that location be because of that site and the need there. And this isn't just a quick, they thought it up a couple of months ago. This has been a several year process. The two million they got came from the last legislative session and they've, they've been hustling and working on this for a while. Karen probably knows what the Boys and Girls. 
<laughs> so yeah, they have been putting a lot of time and effort into this. So it has been over several years that this plan has come together. And everybody who has spoken has spoken well. The, the need is great. Collaboration with the school district has always been right there. The Boys and Girls Club have allowed us to do many things that we couldn't do on our own. But I'm going to go back to a statement that Mark started with when he said, let us help you help us. And in return, we may could have them help us. Um, there is an opportunity for the land behind um, the Box Elder High School, which is currently owned by UTA. And UTA no longer has a need for that land. They are talking about surplusing it. If they surplus it, um, they can give first, first rates of refusal, and the county could take that land and basically exchange us for this, where we would get land that we can't grow behind Box Elder. I, I know at Bear River, we've always been trying to get land. So we could get land right there by Box Elder. And I mean, we need to make sure that the evaluations were all you know, equal, but that's another way rather than just doing cash. I mean, they have right. cash, but they could use that cash for other things in, in building um, the, the New Hope Crisis Center back there if they don't have to. Anyway, the county is interested in helping to make that work too. Right, so. yes, I've talked to Stan Summers on it. He was very enthused, and, and Jeff, right. So we can work out something that will really benefit the whole community, make it smart, and make it cost effective for us. Can I ask, are there specific timelines that we need to be, like, make decisions by, or is your funding based on certain? <laughs> There was one in every class. You knew. I it, know. Right? Uh, Julie, you're right. He does talk too much. <laughs> we, we would love to get this finalized this year. We have funds sitting there ready to get us moving on facility efforts. So our interest would be in the next couple months to have this finalized okay. and moving on. Okay, and that helps. All right. I, I suppose with that, our first order of business would be to bring it to the board to declare it surplus property. For a I, I think I could bring this to the board next month as a, you know, declare for surplus property. That would be step one. Then uh, Dave and I probably need to work with our attorneys and, you know, and find out about the county getting it, land swap, the amount of money, all of all those types of things. Because it, it's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a process, and, and you know, I think this is a great project, and I, I can tell by the board's response they're very interested in action, a acting. So I'd like to make sure that we just follow the process. And the first thing we can do is get it declared surplus, and then we can, at the same time, know more about what we need to do next month. I did tell one that Karen is on our board, too, and I failed to mention that. I appreciate her great service to us. Okay. All right. Thank you. We appreciate that and the presentation it's, and all the support that you have. I think you've worked really hard, and, yeah, we're definitely going to, Explore all the possibilities. <laughs> That's good. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Okay, we're going to jump back up. Yeah, you're welcome to. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Okay, we're going to jump back up to our monthly financial report. So. Okay. Um, I panicked a little bit because I saw April 2022 on the top of the financials and realized that uh, I don't know if, if it if if Rod did a little surprise as he was leaving or not. But anyway, there was a there was a there was a custom header in there that I was not aware of. So anyway, the actual numbers are actually OK. I printed off the uh, I printed off a manual copy. So you guys would have those if they weren't. But they're actually I, I've redone those and looked through those numbers and they're actually they're actually right on. So 
Uh, they actually represent what is for the end of August. Um, I have highlighted, just because I know on time-wise we're already 9 o'clock. I know you guys aren't excited about staying in later, but just highlighted a couple areas. Um, just wanted to show you that one on, on line 45. Uh, the reason that amount was uh, last year, we had uh, accrued so much of that already, was because of ESSER funds. Um, line 48, uh, dues are paid at the beginning of the of the school year, and so that's why it's already re uh, reached its 100% of its budget amount. Um, but that happens every year, just so you guys know that. So I'm not going to highlight that in the future, just so you guys know that, because that is a pattern that occurs uh, each year. Um, and everything else looks really good. Uh, the uh, spending percentages look really good. Um, the revenue looks really good. And the only other number that I wanted you to be aware about is on page, um, I believe it's page, let me look here, page five. Uh, just let you know that we have received uh, the capital for the uh, the smaller school districts in regarding uh, capital projects. And that's why that number is as high as it is on line 136 from the state. Uh, and those funds have been designated to go toward Grouse Creek uh, and building that school. So um, any questions? Other than I apologize for the April header on there. Yep. So we're using all of our um, NEST money? Is that true? No, it's not, it's not NEST money. House Bill uh, 475 allocated additional capital money that we don't wouldn't normally receive. Okay. And it's a, it's a one time it was a one time bill. So it won't we won't be receiving that 1.6 million next That's year. Very good. Yes, it was very timely. Okay, thank you. That looks good. Any questions? I think we're all good on that. Okay, where are we? Board committee reports. Have we've had any board committee since we met last month? Not that I'm aware of. I'll just make mention that uh, Nancy and I and the superintendent were able to go down to the legislative oh, yes. meeting. And one thing that I found to be really enlightening and maybe even added just a little bit of hope is there was a lot of terminology about families. That education is a family is family related. And so as I as I attended that meeting, I thought that was something that I hadn't necessarily heard as much before, mm -hmm. but the word family was used and attached to those bills, or those things that we're proposing. Um, and I really appreciated that because I really believe that. And so there was a strong push in that direction. Yeah. You'll hear more about it when we, when we go meet. to our fall meetings, yeah. but that family was such a focus. Well, so, to, Well, thank you for sharing that, Connie. That's good to hear. And one other thing, um, the we had a we had the senators some senators and representatives talking about financing. I think this is this coming year is going to be a really difficult year for education funding because they're all feeling like they've contributed, they've donated, they've given us plenty, and they're starting to look at social services. So I think this year is going to be a tough year for the for us at the legislature. Mm -hmm. Just heads up, go to the fall meeting. Find out what's happening, what we can do to help. But I think we're going to need all hands on deck for this legislative session. Okay. Late this afternoon, I sent the board a, um, an email. Uh, the city came and met with us yesterday, and there is a, a new build, um, business being proposed. And so I presume that the increment finance committee will be meeting Shortly, I don't know how soon they they wanted to come to us as soon as they found something out. So, uh, I, but I did have a question on that. Um, who is because when I asked Marcy to look that up, she keeps that committee. Uh -huh. We have Karen, and are you on that committee? Yeah. Is it just the two of you? That's what we had. You were on it. Did, did you? It's just you. I think it, it changed. Be, oh, it look, seemed I, like it was just I have that okay. But well, so just let me know. So that's 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 not a, a big rush. So I just that that's something that's going to be coming up because they just found out, and you know, there's been problems in the past where the thing has got down the road a long ways before they brought us in, and so they let yeah. us know that hey, and and I I, I gave you some statistics. Um, it's a big business, 1,100 employees. I think they said that was all. This the, the stuff that I'm saying is all open, right, Dave? Yeah. 1,100 employees. 
Here's the stunner. Medium, median income, 114,000. So 1,100 employees, median 114. And so, and one, one thing they did say that in their study of the county, that there are 4,000 employees that are driving to Salt Lake County to work. Mm -hmm. And so their supposition is that those people with those kind of salaries would give up their jobs in Salt Lake County and, and stay home. Are they looking for that job? Uh, they didn't want us to tell <laughs> what, no. what it was. So I don't know if I'm, I, I, I really don't think they are. But some of them, they called them operators because there was like 71% were operation jobs. So it, it, I, I don't know what degrees or, right. or technical skills they have to have because it is going to be somewhat technical. I think we can go to another question. Okay, that's, that's what we had. Okay. President Taylor, President Taylor, I was just saying, if I'm not on the committee and you need a third person, I'm more than happy to do it. I could, okay. I could go back on. Very good. Okay, thanks, Wade. And I have one other thing from Bridgerland on the committee reports. Okay. This week is their COE accreditation. They are absolutely out of their minds trying to get ready for the accreditation program. But as of next week, things will be much happier over there. <laughs> so the building is on track. If any of you are interested in a medical dental career, brand new beautiful building going up at Bridgerland that's going to be just amazing and fantastic. Anyway, but right now, and they are not, uh, they are still holding... All high school students, um, there's there's no charge to take classes for high school students. So I was over at the wood shop, and we have um, four or five kids over there from Box Elder and Bear River. I think there's like three from Bear River and four or five from Box Elder that are taking their construction classes. So. Well, good. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Let's move on to our policy review. We have several on first reading, and I know the policy committee met, but this is where we talk about what the policy committee talked about usually, so it's not a, a separate. Um, are there any questions? Um, I, I handed just a grammatical to the superintendent, and with that, I would make a motion that we pass the policies on first reading. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion by Karen Cronin to pass the policies on first reading and a second by Connie Archibald. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, policies on first reading pass and second reading. Any comments? I'll make questions? a motion that we approve this evening the, the policy, policy 2220, transportation on second reading. I'll second. second. Okay, so Connie made the motion and I heard Wade and Brian second it, so about the same time. So either one. <laughs> all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that pot. That passes as well. Okay, we've already done our board or the building planning discussion. Our October meeting date. Last time we met, we talked about possibly moving it because of um, fall break, but then we had conflicts with moving it and conflicts with not moving it. So I think we're leaving it the same if that's if that works for everybody. And next in January, when we put together this plan, we'll try to make sure we don't do it on the Wednesday before fall break. But I know that a couple of people couldn't be there if we did it, and a couple of people couldn't be there if we moved it. So I'll be in, Sixes. I'll be in Canada. You'll be in so Canada. I'll be in Texas. Okay. So, and I think <laughs> Tiffany and Nancy were going to be gone if we were, if we moved it. So we we're just going to leave it, but we'll make sure that you're aware of what's going on and, and you can give us your input beforehand. Sorry. So it's going to stay on the 12th for that. Okay, um, let's move on to our consent items. So um, I talked to uh, President Taylor. I was wondering if we could move item 3A out of consent and just talk about that separate. Yes. And with that, I'd make a motion to approve the consent items with the exception of 3A. Okay, we have a motion by Karen Cronin to accept the consent items. Um, we're going to move 3A out. Do I have a second? It's the the ch child supervisory payroll child nutrition. I'm just going to talk about that separately. I'll second. That. Okay, so we have a second by Clyde Wolgamuth. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, all those consent items pass. Let's talk about 3A. Superintendent, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, I was a little slow getting this on the agenda, but it's basically the same email that I sent 
Friday, I believe. Friday, I sent that email to discuss uh, what we're proposing. And this thing has taken probably three or four months to, to get to this point, but I believe it started during the summer um, when um, Candace Parr told us that she was taking the same job in Weber School District, correct, Weber? Was it late spring, was it summer? Okay, and uh, before that, our, our, the, the child nutrition program supervisor before that uh, had left to, to go to Ogden. And before that, the lady left to go to some private business. I can't remember what, Jordan? You know? We've had, five. We've had five and eight years. So with that, uh, the two ladies that worked down in the child nutrition program went to Keith originally and, and talked about an idea that they had. Is that correct, Keith? And, and they wanted to see some consistency in, in uh, this program. And so they uh, proposed to uh, use the two ladies that were there already for some of the services they were already doing, and they proposed hiring a third person. And this third person would be probably, they figured, from the ranks of the uh, unit managers or the, the each building's food service manager. And with that, the three of them would be able to basically run the program. The one caveat to that is, is they still need to have somebody supervisory that has a, a degree and usually nutrition, business, something like that. And so they recommended, and I think Keith was also part of this idea, um, was because of Dave Roberts' exper previous experience in Murray School District, where he was over transportation, food service, facilities. I don't know how many other things you were, the nine. <laughs> but certainly one of those, and his experience at the state office, uh, we proposed to um, have Dave Roberts be the, I guess, the official director of uh, food services. Through this whole process, um, we were able to um, reduce, with, with losing Candace Parr, we reduced that salary, and um, then overall we're saving 31000 and we're proposing to, for Dave's time, extra time, to pay him $1,000 a month, 12000 a year, and we still save the food nutrition program $12,000, excuse me, $31,000 a year. Um, the food nutrition program is not supplemented by the general fund. By, by law, Dave, am I correct? It has, to, it has to remain solvent. And so this really gives us a nice cushion, I believe, that we probably won't have to raise the cost of, of the meals for hopefully a few years. And that's, that's usually generally the only way that we are able to obtain revenue other than Title I and, and free and reduced uh, monies from the federal and the state. So with that, that's that's proposal. Um, as Dave came in um, to the job, we know that Rod was underpaid, but uh, Dave was, uh, we, we didn't give him a raise. This gives us an opportunity to put Dave in a much more favorable position. I think he's still probably underpaid in most of northern Utah uh, and districts throughout the state of similar sizes which, you know, there's not a lot. We're kind of in a weird bubble where we're right in the middle. There's, I think, Irons right underneath 10,000, Provo's right around 10,000, uh, Tooele's now up to 18 or 19, uh, Ogden's, I think, 8 or 9. Am I, does that sound about right? Yeah. And so it's hard to compare them, but when you compare everything, um, this will get Dave even a little closer, but still I don't think on average. I think he did a little research. And, and found, is that is that true, Dave? Would that be right there? So, and I know the board talked as we hired Dave, you know, this is public monies, but we talked about um, uh, having him work for a year and then evaluate that salary. But I, I think that this is a, a good solution and it saves the, the program money. So that's why I put it in as a consent agenda item, just to have it. Okay, so is there any questions or discussion? I, I do have a question, and certainly okay. no offense. I've always felt great confidence that our people have been nutritionists. 
Are we to the point where we can just plug in things on a computer program to get the nutritional values? And then it's just the business administrator that needs to run it? Or I, I appreciate the economy. I appreciate the use. But I got a degree in nutrition. I like to see people doing the good nutrition stuff. Well, I think and, you and did. And is it all computerized? It, you did say it. it I'll let Dave it answer that. But it is. They actually. Go ahead, Dave. So right now, Angie right now does all the menus. Um, what Connie spent a lot of her time with and Keith, yeah. Keith Candace, sorry, Candace did a lot of her time was spent with personnel. Uh, the individual that's coming in will be doing personnel. What I would be spending most of my time with would be working on uh, contracts. Um, any disciplinary issues that would need to ride, rise to my level would be my responsibility. But also reimbursements, uh, contracts, all those kind of things would be what I would be uh, signing off on. So a lot of that is business related. It's not menu related. Um, and we already have somebody that, and, and Candace didn't do it either. Candace didn't work on the menus. That was Angie's responsibility. Yeah, so it's it's more, it is m more of what I'll be doing is is business related stuff. And I I will be tonight and tomorrow night um, studying for serve safe because I'm, I'm going to qualify myself to be in the kitchen. <laughs> and I'm going to be in the kitchen. You know, I, I will go out occasionally, and I will go and, and rub shoulders when, and be in those kitchens. I know it might freak the high school students out to have a uh, – actually, you guys have a male person in the lunchroom this year, don't you? Yeah. But it might be a di different change of pace to see uh, a male in the, in the kitchen every once in a while. But, yes, Nancy, you're right. Um, here's the problem. Um, when you have Ogden School District that's smaller than us uh, paying their coordinators uh, quite a bit more than what we're paying, we have a hard time, a difficult time, retaining a director that has a degree uh, that is not willing, that's willing to drive 20 minutes more uh, to get paid 35 percent more money. That's the issue, and this will be a, this will be an ongoing issue, and it has been. I think the history shows that you know, with five and eight years, that we have a hard time retaining people with degrees uh, in this program. I have a question, and. I just want to make sure that my question it separates Dave from the questions. Mine, mine's more about the position and, and the mechanics of working it. Um, and I do appreciate um, everybody that has come together thinking outside of the box. I think that's great, and so I appreciate that. Um, but in doing some due diligence, I just want to make sure, um, does Dave have the time um, with his current responsibilities as business administrator to take on the added responsibilities. Um, are the added responsibilities worth that, the $1,000 to taxpayers? And then the third one is if at some point in the future um, we decide we, we need that director back, would that um, $1,000 then come out of the salary? That's kind of. Well, I think it's, it's put down as a stipend. And a stipend is one of those things that comes and goes as the responsibility come and goes, like a coach, you know, fire coach, or if the coach doesn't coach anymore, he doesn't get it. So it doesn't go on the salary permanently. It's it, it is a stipend. So I think that does answer that. Yes, that does answer that question. Again, this is not Dave. This is just the position. So with the position, is there enough time to the BA to also handle the responsibilities of the? Is it food services director? I you know, and I think. Uh, as Dave and Keith were in that discussion, with um, it's been two years ago now, uh, the district hired a, an accountant to um, help oversee the transition of Rod and into the new uh, business administrator. So the accountant is Sherry um, Harper, just lost her last name, and she's uh, basically, she does, you know, Heidi Joe, Gary, Keith, they all do those grants, and that's who they work with. So really, a lot of the accounting work, Dave oversees it, but he's really the business administrator now and kind of has, and, and I think as he's looked at this, he felt like it was within his purview to be able to handle handle the load. So I, I think it's not something that we feel like we've dumped on him, but something that, uh, and, and I would point out, it's not like he's just accountant. It is. Uh, after school, and I suspect that would be more frequent and maybe even longer to handle the, the rigors of the job. 
so that may speak to the other question is the added work going to be worth a thousand dollars a month i mean is there that much more added work i i that that i think you know lends to be seen i don't know that for sure but uh, you did say the taxpayers and actually this program pays for itself from both um the state and federal pays most of it, and actual the meals, the cost of the meals is probably less than fifty percent. Is that is that a fair statement, Dave? So, yeah, the taxpayers pay for it in that they pay for the meals. However, they are getting something for that. It isn't like it's different than I guess your taxes going towards somebody's salary. It's if that makes if that makes sense, it's not general fund. Yeah, and so I, I you know I think with the fact we've talked through this. I think we've worked through those issues in our in our mind, and, and in my mind, that's why I did propose it. So I, I feel I feel good about this, and and it does help us, quite frankly, with what we're planning on doing with Dave's salary in another year to take another look. And he's been doing some research. I I know when Rod did the research last year, he actually looked on Utah's right to know, and there's a lot of variables in Utah's right to know. Dave's called these people straight straight up and. He knows the salaries of, of the VAs in his, you know, in, in that realm. And uh, it's, it's, and I think we can share those with you when the time is right. I don't know when that is. So, Lieutenant, so kind of follow uh, Nancy's line of thinking. So it sounds like Dave wouldn't be doing the um, menus and the nutrition no. side of it. So who would do that, and what are their well? Right now, Angie, Angie Gilmore is one of the uh, people who work in the, and she she is the menu preparer, and it is with it's a it's a software program, and basically they have they have the menus prepared. I don't know. I think months in advance, and, and as long as they can. The problem we had this last year was supply and demand, and there was a lot more less supply than there was demand, and so they had to rearrange those. But they still have to make sure there's your amount of carbs and and protein and and you know all, all those things and so that really is in that software program it's it's made this a little bit more of a uh you know cut and paste type of a of a, of a program yeah and how many offerings and angie's in charge of managing all that colby kind of manages the gold you want to come in and go in the daily thing, but there are contracts and grants that Candace did, but maybe that will fall back on here. And then there's still a personnel training piece, which is the third piece coming in. Uh, and at the end of the day, they all three have to pick up some things that they're not used to doing. And then obviously there's going to be some high technical things that only he can do because he's got a bachelor's. And at and and I do believe that we're following the same model as Provo and Ogden. Is that is that correct? This is the, this is a model that we didn't necessarily. I mean, we'd like to say we're real creative, but it it was a model that. <laughs> you know, I know you did. I know you did, but but that's something. You know, we're following this, and we're calling the three. And right now, if this works out, we're actually going to open it up. We have the job description made of the third person that uh, we think would possibly come from being one of the building level managers that has some experience there. And, and right now, as, as, as Dave said, I think both Colleen and Angie, during this past year when we had some serious uh, sickness and personnel shortages, both of those two did go out into the, the, the field and, and work. And I, I'm going to make sure if Dave's out there, I'm going to go eat lunch at that place during that particular school during it. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you let a guy with a beard like that drive a bus, you should let Dave be able to help prepare food. President Taylor, I think when we hired um, Dave Roberts, we understood, at least I understood, what he offered us. And we are, again, fortunate to have him uh, be able to offer us many, many um, gifts and, and different skills. And so with that much said, I'll make a motion this evening that we um, go forward with um, allowing uh, Mr. Roberts to serve as a supervisory uh, payroll nutrition, child nutrition into the program. I second that. 
Okay, so we have a motion by Connie and a second by Wade Hyde to, um, yes, that supervisory payroll for child nutrition program. Assign that to Dave Roberts and. Um, Be before you vote, can I just say one thing? Yes. There's something we probably needed to point out in the policies. And uh, Nancy was there. There's one thing that they're pointed out in the one, I can't remember the number. Maybe Keith's better than I am at remembering. But they are not, um, we from now on have to, it's like when we vote to go into closed session, have to have roll call. Uh -huh. We don't have to have roll call, but we have to name all of the um, votes in the affirmative or in the negative. Okay. So I just wanted okay. to let everybody know that. Not not that anybody's going to vote against this, but it's not. it wouldn't be that we're going to do that new. But since it's the first reading, I'm not sure if we wait till next month to put that Officially, into place probably. Oh. And so... That's one of the things I that wanted to. Yeah, yeah, that's I one of the that. Just we got ready to vote. I thought I needed to point that out. So. Okay. Well, and that's particular to yes, um, distance yeah. meetings where we do Zoom meetings and all where people are not all in the same room. If we do is yeah. voting. Yeah. So that is particular that, to that. But they do want, as total transparency, they want an actual vote of mm -hmm. who, voted of for who what? did what. Yeah, okay. President Taylor, from going forward, uh, you, you probably need to call each board member by name and have them say yay or nay. Okay, what if, do we have to say yay or nay, or can think, we just say all in favor, and if it's like, if it was unanimous? I think they said no. something. No, you have to go forward. Even if it's unanimous, you still have to have each board, you have to actually say their list, names. list the names and put a yay or nay by them. Okay. President Taylor, I, I know in our training when we went as yeah. president and vice president, they told us we needed to do that then. Oh, did they? And I tried it, and it just was time-consuming, yeah. so I kind of let it go, but yeah. I think you are okay. supposed to. All righty, folks. Well, let's practice then, shall we? So we had a motion by Connie and a second by Wade to accept this proposal and recommendation we've talked about. So, Wade, Hyde. Yes. Connie Archibald. Yes. Karen Cronin. Yes. Julie Taylor. Yes. Tiffany Summers. Yes. Brian Smith. Yes. Brian Smith, yeah. Clyde Wogelman. Yes. Nancy Kennedy. So do I have to, okay, the motion passes. Um, so do I have to say the names or can we say them like our own name? Anyhow. Okay. I think either way. Either way, okay. Okay, sorry, just want to be, I think so, but I'm not. Okay, we'll just give you a little list. We'll get a seating chart and you can just check. Okay, thank you. Thanks for pointing that out and Probably do that. Okay, upcoming um, or suggestions for future board meetings. Did we talk about that already? I know um, Brian wanted to the numbers and st was that? Well, yeah, I just wanted to take a look at as we're trying to decide what to do with the foothill. Look at your projections for. You you kind of mentioned it yeah. that you're already I'll, doing it. Yeah, but. I will have. A Yeah. Sort of we need to hang on to that property because we know it's good. This is going to happen. Need, whether we build a new school or keep that school, we so need to know. Yep. Yep. For a new property. Right, right. right. Yeah. Okay. But we can declare mountains as Yes. It's not a package Yeah, we don't want to do that. Yeah. 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 Are there any other suggestions for future board meetings? Or? I, Oh, Tiffany, sorry, go ahead. I wondered if we could um, have a report on our DLI, that first class that just tested through um, on the north end for Stanish. I'm just curious. Where, where are we at right now, Heidi Joe? I'm Jo? about that testing, how they did. Was it in the spring that they took that test? It would have been the fresh. The, the success rate of that yeah. first so the ninth exam. grade program in the north end. Yeah, we did the last yeah. day there. I thought I saw. Well, in the October, the spring, yeah. November, Okay, so I must be, okay, very good. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I thought I saw that in the future. Does that include AP, the students taking AP? It probably would from last year. Yep. I think Jeremy does a presentation. But yep. it, but maybe we just want to make, Jeremy, we'll make like sure. we want to kind of be a little bit specific on some of those. Okay, any others? Karen? Um, I talked with a couple of people in the county. They had somebody come and talk to them about some of the numbers of growth and um, tax revenues. 
I wonder if we could have them come talk to us since they've already done the work. Just kind of yeah. that would help us because we get seventy percent, right? So let's see what they're they're looking as what things are growing, um, what things okay. may be declining. Do you, know, do you know who that is? Um, Find out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would be good yeah. to know. Okay. Um, upcoming events. Fall meeting is next Wednesday. Um, it's going to be at. Well, the, there's the schedule. So if you can't go next Wednesday, there's more than one. But our district has been invited to go with the Morgan Weaver, Ogden, <laughs> Box Elder, and Davis at the Timber Mine. Um, we just need to let Superintendent know if you're planning on going down, so we can get transportation down together. We'd have to leave about. I think it said it said thirty. 31 minutes to get there, yeah. so I, I think 515 would 515? Be, feel, okay. I'd feel a little safer. Yeah. yeah. Who'd okay. like to go Who with, would... with Dave? Dave and I will, yes, okay. I'm so, going. Okay, Tiffany for sure. Julie. Julie. Okay. 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 Don't rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, that's oh, very cool. It's in Evanston. The meeting's in Wyoming. I grew up in Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> that's my hope. That's my. Son. I just didn't realize that they. I went to Lyman. Yeah. Fair Lake Pete Lyman last Tuesday. I guess Lyman Gilly Farm is the, the earlier district. The one to go to. Yeah, the two. Elder, huh? I'll, I'll, I'll go with you on there. Brian will go. Okay. So right now I have Tiffany, Julie, Brian, and 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 um, Karen, a definite maybe. Okay. So question mark. I'll. Okay. Oh. 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 oh, oh. Say. <laughs> Good reason. And Very like important. I'll okay. let you know, Pleasure. Superintendent. Okay. Yeah, just let him know as soon as possible, and then we can arrange that. We'll plan on meeting here at 515 to go down to that. All right. Um, with that, we are going to move into a closed meeting. I make a motion that we uh, close our regular meeting and go into a closed meeting to discuss character of an individual. I'll second. So we have a motion by Karen and a second by Brian to move into closed meeting. So we'll start down with Wade. Wade Hyde, yes. Thanks for being here. <laughs> We're going into closed meeting. Yes. It is. I am ready. Yeah. Karen Cronin, yes. Yeah. Julie Taylor, yes. There's more. There's this. There's this. <laughs> Tiffany's turn. <laughs> Clyde Wolgamuth, yes. Okay. We're going to go into the other room. 